is other initiative by government of karnataka and success stories this session will be handled by shri sunil power ceo cg and miss annapurna project director kutumba i welcome ceo sunil power sir to take over the session thank you a very good morning to all of you no. it's indeed a matter of great privilege and happiness to be a part of this workshop <coughs> so uh, today uh, our secretary sir has already spoken about what we are doing in karnataka he has touched briefly about it my colleagues will be now uh, talking to you in details about what we are doing <coughs> can you so in karnataka like all other states we have been able to use aadhar in enabling good governance in karnataka now while uh, in, during the earlier one workshop which happened on the re recent initiatives in aadhar in delhi there also there was talk of auto eligibility there was talk of uh, need based uh, scoring Uh, we are happy to announce that we have actually while the country is talking about it we have actually achieved this this we have actually uh, these are the basic statistics for uh, about karnataka however i would like to tell you that karnataka is an pioneer in e governance we had a separate e governance department in 2003 and many of the states still don't have that it is usually clubbed with it but in karnataka we do have that almost 90% of all our services are being electronic electronically delivered and uh, we have reached our citizen service centers have reached in the form of grama one at the village levels now at the gram panchayat levels these are certain unique things which th that's why we are able to actually utilize the whole ecosystem which is uh, offered by aadhar these are some of our common digital infrastructures this is again a very good thing about karnataka is that uh, e governance departments create such common digital infrastructures which are used by all the department across the government so be it e procurement be it kutumba be it khajane e procurement state scholarship portal all these uh, most of them created by e governance department some created by other departments like finance the khajane but they are being used across the departments So our uh, Aadhar enrollment journey started in 2011, and we have reached 99.4 percent of the population. Uh, it is being extensively used as a proof of address, not uh, as as a proof of identity, as well as a uh, enabler for financial addresses. One good thing is that in many of the states what is happening is that section 7 and section 4 notifications are being attempted in slightly disjointed ways but karnataka government what we are doing is that e governance department act as a nodal agency and that's how we are able to for all the departments whenever they need a uh, notification for good governance under uh, section 4 we are able to get it done because there is only one department who uh, all the other departments will sit together there is a committee and the gos are issued by e governance department so this is one major factor where we have been able to harness uh, this uh, i'll we we know why uh, uh, i will skip this part why we need aadhar this has been talked in detail but uh, the organic and inorganic seeding also so i have here the uh, difficulties in organic and inorganic seeding but we we'll, uh, the inorganic seeding has more or less now been abandoned and only organic seeding is being uh, undertaken we there are i uh, three factors why karnataka is able to utilize the aadhar ecosystem in a better way number one is because of the i told you about section 7 and section 4 notifications the way they are handled so it has become easy for the departments to do it the second is uh aadhar user agency instead of each department opting for a license we have 
centrally got e-governance department as AUA, and the services are offered to all the departments. Thirdly, the HSM, the requirement of storing uh, secure keys, that is also a central service being offered by government of Karnataka. So otherwise, in many states, when we talk, they are talking about the difficulties in uh, investing in the HSM infrastructure. So that's why at our data center, as well as at the DR site of our data center, we have this infrastructure, and we are able to give this as a service to all the departments. <coughs> we have a list of uh, programs where Aadhaar is being used, and uh, you will see uh, we have different agencies who are using, we have uh, uh, coverages, we have what section it has been enabled, and the purpose. So this is just uh, to give an outline of how we are using Aadhaar. So now, with this background, I would now request my colleague Anpurna. She will be taking on and uh, uh, taking this uh, discussion further and telling you about how Kutumba, one of these, one of these many initiatives is Kutumba, how it has been you, it is being used, and how we have been able to utilize Aadhaar in building Kutumba. Thank you, uh, Anpurna. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, sir, for introducing Kutumba. It is an honor to present the project Kutumba as one of the success stories which is using Aadhaar as its basis in this August audience. So Kutumba was envisaged somewhere in 2018-19, where government of Karnataka in its budget announced a family database would be created by connecting the PDS database with all other different department databases. The concept behind this announcement was the government asked two important questions. Why should a citizen have to apply when all the data is available with the government? And why should a citizen have to visit multiple departments to get proof of his eligibility and resubmit it to another department? So with these two questions in mind, government came up with the concept of family database. So when announced in 2018-19, Department of e-governance was made the nodal department. We took the food database and then connected various other databases. As on today, it is currently an ecosystem which is connected to multiple department IT systems. It has five important components, a social registry, which is a centralized data repository, a beneficiary registry. It is a collection of data where benefits have been given to various departments under various schemes are given by various departments under various schemes. We have integrated beneficiary management system. This is basically department IT systems which allow citizens to apply. Now whether Kutumba, all citizens are covered in Kutumba, the answer remains no. There are still a lot of citizens who are yet to be covered. So do we deny them a provision from becoming eligible for the schemes? The answer says we cannot deny them. So they have an on request module where they apply on the concerned department systems to avail the benefits. The fourth system is a payment portal. Karnataka State DBT portal is connected, so which would be handled in detail in the next sessions. And the last one is a grievance redressal. Karnataka has integrated public grievance redressal system, a single platform for all redressals, grievances to be addressed. So Kutumba is onboarded on that. So any citizen having any problem with Kutumba can conveniently apply or uh, raise his grievance on this portal. So objectives of Kutumba are mainly five. The first one is, like Secretary Sir said, how do we bring about business process re-engineering where the processes are simplified, citizens have a better user experience. Second one is, as an offshoot of this better user experiences, ask only once. Once a citizen gives a particular data to one department, it should be available with all other departments. There should be no need for the citizen to resubmit the data again in another department. The third one is to weed out ineligible beneficiaries. This is important from plugging the revenue leakages point of view. So whether this is a primary concern of Kutumba is no. While we do other objectives, this is one of the byproduct where we are able to help the department in identifying and weeding out ineligible beneficiaries. The fourth one is evidence-based planning. As Secretary Sir said, data should be, it should be a data-driven approach. Each department should plan its scheme based on data. 
So required or requisite data needs to be provided to the departments to plan and implement the schemes better. And the last one is Suomoto delivery. So Suomoto delivery is when government knows citizens who are eligible for a particular scheme. Can we deliver benefits Suomoto automatically without the citizen having to apply? This has been successfully demonstrated in two schemes. One is CM Raita Vidyanidhi program where with the help of data from fruits database, we were able to identify the citizens, uh, children of farmers who were eligible for scholarship and nearly seven lakh students have been paid automatically without them having to apply. The second one is old age pensions where we are sharing the data of citizens who are reaching the age of 60 but economically poor. So that data is used by the Directorate of Social Security Pension to deliver the social security pension without the citizen having to apply. Now, how did this database was created? So family database was created. Uh, we had two options. E-governance had two options to go and create. One was to adopt the survey-based approach, which was used by Rajasthan, was even approached or they were used by Telangana to create a centralized database. Whereas the other approach which we adopted was to connect the databases which are available with different departments. The advantage of this was because in Karnataka, most of the departments have their own IT systems which are stabilized and robust. That enabled us to connect various databases. In this uh, pictorial, uh, picture, in this uh, slide, we can see that we have connected multiple department databases where a data quality and standardization is carried out. Then we integrate records by matching and merging, creating a golden records and details of benefits, which are then shared with multiple user departments. The important point to note in this slide is the matching and merging process. So for matching and merging, this is where Aadhaar came as a support to us. Most of the databases had connect, collected Aadhaar, either through inorganic or organic seeding. So we adopted a hashing technique, which was a one-way hash, which was then used to connect the records and then carried out by name match. We followed it by name match to ensure the records are correctly linked. So this enabled us to connect multiple department data sets so that we, had, we were able to create a golden record of a citizen. When I say golden record of citizen, it is like Annapurna, what's her name, what, I mean, sorry, what's her date of birth, what is her gender, what is her uh, caste, what is her income, what is her education status, whether she has availed any housing benefit, whether she has Aishman Bharat health card, all these details are connected to each other. And now once this is connected, departments, when they want to implement the scheme, they can just refer to our data to identify who are the ones they need to cover. Now housing department extensively uses our data to identify beneficiaries who are already availed housing benefits from various schemes because multiple departments provide housing benefits. So they need this data to deduplicate. So once the records are integrated, one critical aspect that we ensure is we return the Kutumba ID, which is a unique ID, which underlying layer being the Aadhaar. Hence, this is also unique. So this is returned to the departments to seed in their databases. Advantages of this, if tomorrow departments want to check some parameter of their beneficiary, they use this Kutumba ID to call on the Kutumba database and fetch the details. They don't have to retouch the beneficiary to ask any detail from the said citizen. So what does Kutumba do? Now Kutumba has mainly eight key activities. One, we collect the data from various departments and once we collect the data, we own the data. We say that once it is connected, the ownership of the data comes with Kutumba. Then once we have collected, the purpose of collection is enabling sharing with other departments. So can sharing be done as per the department's request? No. There has to be some rules and it needs to be seamless. This is where a data governance structure which was set up in Karnataka comes into play. We have a three-tier data governance structure in Karnataka where there is a working group at the department level which verifies the requests which come in from department and approves them. So once the approval is given, the data fields are shared through a seamless process. 
we create a federated citizen database. It is not possible today to Kutumba to store all parameters pertaining to a citizen. I may have currently what class, whether the student or the child is studying in the school. So I may have a SATS ID, but which school the student is studying, which class is he studying, what has been the grade of the child, this is not stored by Kutumba. It continues to remain with the parent database that is the SATS system. So that federated database approach has been adopted in Kutumba. We identify the beneficiaries we, because there is a Aadhaar, there is a identity authentication and validation. And we also help the departments in removing duplicate or ineligible beneficiaries. One important part which CEO sir mentioned where in Aadhaar 2.0 workshop where they are talking about needy score or prioritization of beneficiary. This is, becomes critical where budget is a constraint and the number of citizens who are eligible for a particular scheme is large. So how do you determine who should be given? So there is a need to have something called as deprivation index or needy score. This was already attempted. It's not a new concept. It was attempted by Government of India through a SECC survey in 2011. But that SEC survey was a manual survey, data went stale. There are a lot of challenges, but whether we can electronically use that by connecting databases and identifying deprived families, this has been attempted through a POC and it has been successful. So once this data is available, the departments will have an objective means of shortlisting the beneficiary for schemes. Selection of beneficiary becomes objective and we provide a accurate and reliable beneficiary database. How do we do it? Kutumba, the social registry is the core of the system. So departments connect through it only through APIs. And there are both forward and reverse integration. This is important. And uh, the reason is data gets updated in source databases on daily basis. That needs to, get, needs to be updated into Kutumba because we need to keep our data live and updated. So that comes to reverse integration. Departments can always verify and validate the data available in Kutumba, and we have given a citizen enrollment which will allow them to verify or modify the data. So how do we use Aadhaar in Kutumba? So in Kutumba is uh, notified under 44B2 as an entitlement management system. We use Aadhaar for carrying out EKYC of the citizen. We also use it for deduplication. So we do duplicate to see that the same citizen does not enroll more than once within Kutumba. We use it for gen determining the genuinity of the citizen before de de delivery of uh, benefits. Housing uh, department uses this to check with our database to check the genuinity of the applicant in housing systems. We use it as financial address. Now when we specifically, it becomes critical in Suomoto where the citizen does not apply then how do we deliver the cash benefit? Then we have the tokens of Aadhaar. We give that as a financial address. Citizen gets benefit without him or her having to provide account number or any other details. And last part is second factor of authentication for department users. So department can use our data to confirm it is a correct data. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, Kutumba gets seeded into each of the department database. Kutumba being, uh, since it writes over the Aadhaar number, it helps the department uh, to use it as a primary key and departments can interact with each other using Kutumba ID also. It empowers the residents because we allow for e-sign. Today a citizen comes and updates a data pertaining to her. Then how do we know the same person? It is a valid update. So we allow the e-sign feature of Aadhaar where they can verify that uh, they have validated or rather they can validate themselves. It allows uh, implementation of Suomoto delivery and adoption of single sign-on. Now uh, single sign-on using Aadhaar is one of the key innovations which Kutumba is currently using. Today when a citizen registers in databases, he creates a user ID and password, which we know is a challenge because multiple department IT bases, multiple user IDs and passwords. So we have, we are currently using a single sign-on of CDAC where in Kutumba, a citizen can just log in to see his data using her Aadhaar. So they log in using Aadhaar, validate themselves and have access to the data. So there is no requirement of citizen creating an account 
or creating a user ID password in Kutumba. Some of the use cases which are currently being used or we have developed and are being implemented is ask only once. So ask only once removes the need for submission of documents, reduces the requirement of verification also. User experience is improved. Now nearly 30, 35 systems are currently using where citizen gives only his Kutumba ID or ration card or Aadhaar number. All the data gets auto-populated into the system which he sees and verifies and approves. It improves citizen interactions also with the department because there's a kind of trust building happens because citizen is shown the data which is in Kutumba. So if there is any error, they are allowed to edit and it gives a authentic, reliable data of citizens to departments. So department is also a big gainer because they now don't have to worry if a data comes from Kutumba, it is a single source of truth. Aishman Bharat uh, National Health Authority has taken up a campaign through Health and Family Welfare Department for enrolling BPL and APL card holders into the national, uh, this Aishman Bharat uh, scheme. So that is integrated with Kutumba, so their citizen just gives his Aadhaar number or ration card, data gets pre-populated, so the entire enrollment process hardly takes less than a minute to complete. There is no data entry, whereas in other states they have to fill in the data fields. So Kutumba is supported through, uh, Nagrama one is the implementing partner for the scheme. So. One of the objectives which uh, Secretary Sir was stressing is business process re-engineering. Business, uh, now when Kutumba is sharing data, one process note is always written to suggest to the department how the business process re-engineering can be brought in and s processes be streamlined. So Amrit Jyoti scheme is a scheme of energy department where 75 units of electricity is provided free of cost to or rather a subsidy is given to SCST beneficiaries who are also BPL card holders. So when the department initially came up with the scheme guidelines, they had this process where there was an online application where citizen was required to submit, upload the documents, later submit the copy of the documents to subdivision office. So there were nearly six documents. So there was a requirement of printing or Xerox of six documents. Around, they wanted the application form to be printed out and then submitted because they want a field verification was to be carried out. Manual verification was envisaged through ESCOM meter reader and uh, average time estimated was around seven to 20 days and uh, three to four visits is expected by the citizen to follow up whether the subsidy has been sanctioned or not. With uh, after BPR using Kutumba, now it's an online application, data auto fetch from Kutumba. No documents if it is a cell phone property, only rental agreement for rented properties or if meter is in different name. Then there is no requirement of Xeroxing, submission of documents, verification is done automatically by the system, instantaneous uh, verification it takes and a citizen has to just go once to enroll into the scheme. After that, the citizen is not required to visit. So the cost for these activities was estimated to be, if you go by the conservative estimate, it works out to around 22.25 crores would have been the total cost considering the various aspect. Whereas uh, after BPR, the cost can be, is now estimated to be just 1.1 uh, crores. Another use case is beneficiary targeting, where uh, this uh, old age pensions, which I stated, were uh, being used. We provide a likely eligible list to the department of people who are uh, reaching the age of 60 with annual income less than 32,000, so that they, and uh, land holding less than five acres. So those uh, individuals are eligible for old age pension. So the list is given by Kutumba which then is used by DSSP to sanction pensions, Suomoto. They are also, we also provide some exclusion criteria. So let's say today a citizen has a well old age pension, it's a recurring pension. So, but somebody in his family has now got in a government job, the annual income of the family is exceeded 32,000. Earlier there was no means unless the citizen himself reported or somebody complained against it. But Kutumba now automatically identifies such details and provides to the department to remove, do a verification and remove them from the 
pension. Come in, uh, revenue department announced in Hello Revenue Minister scheme where they said if a citizen calls for any service uh, of revenue uh, through a call center, within 72 hours the scheme benefit would be provided. This system is integrated with Kutumba. They fetch the details of the citizens from Kutumba, verify and approve online at the moment of the call. So they are able to meet the 72 hours target. Plugging revenue leakage is one of the important uh, results of this Kutumba. So if you can see, I have just indicated the recurring pen benefit schemes and one housing scheme. Food department, we shared the data of deceased. Now this is where e Janma, the birth and death registry which is connected to Kutumba comes into play. Every death registered in uh, e Janma is shared with Kutumba and Kutumba broadcasts this deceased details to various departments. So when a penny beneficiary, let's say a pensioner or a ration card holder dies, we broadcast it every week, once a week. Department can remove the person from their beneficiary database. So from food department estimates that nearly 18 crores of savings per month is a result of this both removal of uh, deceased as well as removal of ineligible BPL card holders. So ineligible means income, uh, paying income tax or PT ta uh, professional tax or having a large land holdings. This data is shared by Kutumba so they are able to remove this. Old age pensions, uh, Directorate of Social Security Pensions also utilizes the data. Today, if you have seen, they have uh, made a, there's a paper uh, article where they've said nearly 450 crores have been saved. We are uh, estimating it is around 220. They have done some additional verification, but uh, using Kutumba data, they have been able to save around 220 crores to the state exchequer. Housing department did two activities. One activity of one-time deduplication where they identified nearly 65,000 to 70,000 beneficiaries who were marked as homeless, houseless, but were actually given benefits. So that with the unit cost of 1.2 lakh per house, that was a large savings they could do. Second is uh, every now CM's uh, one lakh housing scheme, they have done deduplication using Kutumba. They have identified about uh, 1,000 plus applicants who already were sanctioned, so that works out around 30 crores of savings. So this is a brief introduction on Kutumba, one of the success stories which was made possible because of Aadhaar. Thank you. So thank you very much, madam, for the comprehensive presentation. Now our DDG sir, Gopalan sir, would like to say a few words. Thank you ma'am uh, for a very uh, informed presentation. I would uh, congr congratulate the government of Karnataka for this Kutumba initiative that because that is exactly what we want from the state governments. We are helping the state governments, we are requesting the state governments to build their own data walls so that they can add further fields. We are prohibited by law from adding any more fields. And therefore, you cannot count on UIDI for your uh, database needs. The best way is to form your own database. And the database security and all are your responsibility. UIDA is there to authenticate your beneficiaries once. That once that one time when authentication is over, you please assign a different uh, unique number for that beneficiary within your database. Inform that beneficiary about that unique number so that he will also use that number instead of other in all his transactions with that particular department or government. Because other is collected on trust basis. We do not uh, go for authentication and verification of the data that you provide us. We ask you for evidence. We ask you for documents to prove your claim. Like for example, when you enroll for Aadhaar, we ask you to give a proof of identity, proof of address, a proof of date of birth. But we do not interact with that authority. For example, if you have given your date of birth, proof of date of birth as a 10th uh, uh, class 10 mark, mark sheet. We do not send it to the state government to verify whether the mark sheet was authentic, number one. 
secondly we do not ask you to check the data provided in that mark sheet you see the certificate could be from the right authority but the content could be wrong the date of birth could be wrong the data provided in the certificate could be wrong that is why we insist that you build your database and you take responsibility for your data and the third one i would like to uh, tell you is the about comparing data which our secretary sir also mentioned that is why we said that we have brought out a notification saying that for comparison comparing database purposes each state government is a single unit within that state government you don't have to do encryption of data basically what uh, secretary sir said na when some other department said sir it has aadhar number so i cannot share with you no within the same state government they can share now you want to compare a database de du duplicate your database with uh, another state government or with the government of india for example some time ago we we got a request from puducherry administration they wanted to find if any of their pds beneficiaries are also beneficiaries in the neighboring tamil nadu districts now that involves comparing databases of two states for which we have issued instruction how it could, should be done there also we have very clear instructions about how it should be proceeded and we help help there so at least within the government of karnataka for comparing databases you don't have to come to us thank you i just want to clarify these points and this is you are participants you are not observers so that basically means you have to participate i request you to participate more often and more frequently thank you rimesh sir now moving on to the next session it is latest updates for states public registrars this will be handled by our director sri pavan kumar pawa sir and in the meantime i request our director sir to honor our uh, speaker Ma annapurna madam with a small memento thank you good afternoon ladies and gentlemen this is a small session uh, there are some latest updates from uh, uidi as well as central government which we need to bring into the notice of uh, state government as well as the registrars so some of the circulars are specific to the state government and the other circulars are specific to the uh, all the registrars so there are some developments in the last uh, previous two months which uh, which are very important and uh, the some letters have been issued by the ministry of electronics and it uh, to all the states mentioning the requirements what exactly are the requirements so i will i will touch upon those points i'll not go into the detail because details are already there in the circulars which we have given to all the departments we have kept into the compendium of all the uh, departments so i'll just touch upon those points which are those which are relevant uh, uh, as of now so first point where is that so first point is that this is the update document feature actually there is a new feature which has been enabled uh, in the in the ecmp client uh, this is the requirement wherever the aadhar is more than 8 to 10 years old the resident need to update their aadhar so that is the requirement even if the resident has not changed their address or they have not moved outside then also this is a requirement to upload their poi poi means the proof of identity as well as the proof of address these are the highlights basically this i have mentioned as a uh, these bullet points uh, the, the details are available in the circulars wherever it is a more than 10 year 8, 8 to 10 years back but they are not moved out so still they are remaining in the same then also the resident need to upload the poi as well as the poa in order to provide facility aadhar there is a feature update uh, document it is already uh, updated in the client above which can be accessed online through my aadhar portal that actually this facility is available um, online as well as the offline and in both the modes uh, this is available so this 
As of now, it has been started in pilot more than 40 districts. That is five districts of each UIDA regional office. But this needs to be scaled up in all the districts uh, of uh, the country by December 2022. And uh, this exercise will begin with awareness program. Actually, the awareness is required. That that's why the central government has written to the state government that the awareness needs to be created amongst the residents so that the residents can come up for updating their POI as well as the POA. So here it is requested to the state government. So kindly, uh, 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 kindly uh, create the awareness. So the programs basically we are also approaching the district uh, administration. So the state government is requested to sensitize the district administration about the requirements so that the residents can be benefited of this uh, uh, uploading of documents. You may open the link. This is the OM which is written by the, which is sent by the central government to the state government. This is 23rd of August That is the first one. And the next one is the, that is a new development. Creation of state government portal to facilitate verification of new other enrollment and documents submitted by residents. So the highlight of this particular circular are these. In order to strengthen the other enrollment process for the adult population, the system verification by state before gener generating other has been introduced. So this is only for the new enrollment, wherever there is a new enrollment of the adult population, then the verification by the state has been introduced. In this, a nodal officer to be designated, nominated by each state for this purpose. All the new adult uh, enrollment requests received by UIDA shall be shared with the designated state, uh, uh, this uh, nodal officer, for carrying out the verification of residential status, demographic information and documents furnished by the residents. Then the state government through the mechanism available at district, sub district may verify the residential status and also the demography information furnished by the individual address. In order to implement the above provision, UIDA is developing a state government portal. Actually, this is under process and this will be completed by 30th of November. That is the state government portal in which the verification will be done by the nodal officer of the state. Please open the link. This is the recent uh, OM, 9th of September, it is written by uh, the central government to the, all the state governments. Creation of state government portal to facilitate verification of new Aadhaar enrollment. So these circulars have also been uh, circulated to all the departments here. So kindly go through these uh, requirements. The third one is the, that is, uh, this is also a new development that the new enrollment of the adults will be only through the designated centers. So what uh, designated Aadhaar centers. Designated Aadhaar center, this is the highlights basically. It has been decided to restrict the facility only new enrollment of adult residents. There, is, there will be a restriction uh, on, on, only on the new enrollment of the adult population, not on the child, children. And uh, this is all UID, ASK, all state district level Aadhaar center run by CAC. And the designated Aadhaar centers run by Indian Post and the designated Aadhaar center run by state government registrars at district sub district level. Now the, the uh, RO will follow with the state government as well as the other registrar also to designate the uh, Aadhaar centers where the new enrollment of the adult population will be carried out. So we'll be reaching out to the registrars as well as the state government uh, to accommodate this uh, feature in the system. The fourth one, uh, the fourth updation is that constitutional district level Aadhaar monitoring committees so this is also a letter has been written by the central government to all the state government about the constant actually there is a provision of uh, state level committee which chief secretary is the chairperson of that committee and now uh, that is already in place in all the states so state government uh, uh, this is the U uidic committee 
and now there is a provision has been added for constitution of a district level committee so district level committee to monitoring to monitor the uh, this one aadhar related services so this in order to minimize this at present only state this uh, scheduled commercial banks are working registrars uidi has put in place a mechanism for periodic inspection and monitoring state uh, uh, ut governments have been requested to constitute district level aadhar monitoring committees to monitor the aadhar related issues the committee will also be responsible for monitoring the aadhar center designated for new enrollment for adult as mentioned above so this is related to the third required third operation which is there for the restricted uh, uh, enrollment on the designated centers only so that also will be monitored by this uh, district level committee so district level committee uh, we uh, we have already approached to the state government and in the near future also will be approaching to state government for the constitution for the constitution of the state uh, sorry district level aadhar monitoring committee so that uh, this uh, monitoring can uh, can be possible we can open the link so this is the om which is issued by the central government constitution district level uh, this is also 9th of september recent one come down just a minute go up go up so this is the constitution district magistrate and collector will be the chairman and all these uh, uh, these officers these uh, designations will represent your dlbc superintendent of police district coordinator cse governance and the senior most district level so this these will be the uida will also be there in the in the committee and uh, once this committee will be constituted then we can have regular meetings monthly meetings also for this committee please close this the fifth one the fifth uh, operation is that uh, the about the rd devices rd devices the register device so as of now uh, only few of the registrars they have the rd devices available in their ecm prison now the requirement of uh, rd devices is uh, much more rd device will facilitate the print aadhar as well as the find aadhar feature uh, so that the resident uh, will be if suppose there is no rd device then that center particular center will not be able to provide the services uh, related to the print aadhar as well as the find aadhar so rd device basically it, it enables the fingerprint device single fingerprint device as well as single iris device so it needs to be uh, it needs to be provided to all the centers so it is requested that uh, the to the registrars that the rd devices may be provided to all the ecmp clients which is the requirement this is highlighted here so this is basically the background what rd device will uh, uh, how it will serve the uh, the uh, citizens through print aadhar service resident can get a e print uh, e aadhar bypassing a charge of rupees 30 through biometric authentication this facility is useful uh, through mobile where wherever the mobile number is not linked then this facility will be useful to to the citizens so in order to provide the above function of the service as this is this the registrars are requested to ensure availability of hard devices single fingerprint scanner and single iris device at all aadhar enrollment centers so a letter has been written to by uidi headquarters to all the registrars please open that letter link this is also a recent uh, uh, om this is 17th of august this is through ecmp client so it is requested to all the registrar to kindly ensure the rd devices on their uh, uh, every each and every aadhar center so that the residents can get benefit uh, of these services so presently the numbers are very less uh, i don't have uh, the readmit number as of now but the numbers are very less i think it may be 10 to 15% not more than that so it is requested kindly ensure this uh, requirement the sixth one is that the sixth one latest update is that this is the uh, as of now there is no uniformity in the uh, observance of the holidays or the breaks in running the aadhar uh, service center now there is a requirement that at least 10% of the centers will run on every on all 7 days at least 
So this is a registrar to ensure at least 10% of the Aadhaar, Aadhaar enrollment centers run by each registrar remain operational all, on all seven days. So it needs to be uh, managed in such a way so that the weekly off and all these things can be given to the staff. Still it can run on the seven days basis. In case any difficulty by the registrar in making at least 10% of the Aadhaar enrollment center on all the seven days, registrar to observe weekly off on any convenient day between Monday to Friday rather than availing on Sunday. The weekly off selection may be considered on different days for different registrar for the same area to ensure this. Please open the circular. This is also 25th of August. It is sent by UID headquarters. Come down. This has been circulated to all the registrars for the making uh, it implementation. Thank you. So these are the seven require seven operations basically, <laughs> which are very important and the latest one. So state government is requested to kindly uh, sensitize the district administration for uh, compliance or implementation of the guidelines here. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pawan, sir, for sharing the latest updates. There is a slight change in. Uh, uh, program. Now I will be moving on to the, in, instead of brief overview on key developments of usage of other, we will be moving on to the process of notifying of schemes for use of other under section 7 and section 44B2 of other act. This section will be handled in the two parts. First part will be handled by Dr. Saroj Adhikari, a deputy director from UAD headquarters. Then it will be handled by Mr. Srivasava, project director, DBT, government of Karnataka. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, namaste to all, all, one, all everybody and our respected Deputy Director General Sells. Uh, Secretary Sells, uh, my session will be a little brief because in the morning uh, we have already discussed about uh, how Department of uh, Personnel and Administrative Reform has already notified, uh, most of the schemes are notified under Section 7. And also, uh, Karnatuk is the only state perhaps they have used section 44B2 a maximum number of times. Uh, but this presentation uh, will talk about some compliance related matters. Uh, essentially, in the all state level workshops, which we have started in the month of July, it was initiated by our regional office Bangalore under the leadership of our Deputy Director General Gopalan Sir in Kerala on 6th of July, 7th, uh, 9th of July, no, I think 6th of July. Uh, from that time till now, almost 25 states we are covering and we are going to all states as much as possible and we are trying to uh, give an orientation about this particular topic that uh, how Section 7 can be used by the different departments for use of Aadhaar. Also, 44B2 which has come later on. So, in case of Karnataka, it is little, for me, it is little peculiar now I am talking about, I will be talking about some of the things which you have observed and uh, please appreciate uh, that from the point of view of UIDI and from the uh, legal uh, point of view, legal compliance point of view, uh, we need to look at a couple of points. In all other states, uh, this presentation is essentially for the departments because uh, departments actually are implementing, they notify the scheme, notify, uh, they, they notify for use of Aadhaar under Section 7. In case of Karnataka, it is the only state in the country where one department as a nodal, Department of uh, Personal Administrative Reform, DPAR, they have taken the responsibility for on behalf of all the departments. So my presentation will be essentially addressed to uh, Center for E-Government's team. So, yeah. uh, what are the provisions are there uh, to use Aadhaar? So without legal provisions, at least the governments cannot use Aadhaar. That is, I think, clear to everyone. All of us, we are in the room. Uh, there are essentially four provisions under which the other can be used. The main and foremost is the Section 7. You know, Section 7 is called the heart of the other act. During 2017-18, when the other act was challenged, you might be aware of that. Because of Section 7, our other act was judged as constitutionally valid by the uh, constitutional bench. Uh, under Section 7, the government can ask for other, requirement of other is required for delivery of any benefit, service, or subsidy. 
Uh, till today, around uh, almost 95% uh, central schemes are notified since 2017 onwards. And states around 700, as per our report till 30th June this year, but from the states and regional offices, we have collected the data. Around 700 schemes are notified by the states, including government of Karnataka. Government Karnataka has the maximum number of schemes which are notified. Under 44B2, under 44B2, which was introduced in 2019, after the Supreme Court judgment came in 2018, that actually mandates the voluntary usage of Aadhaar, you know, under which we have talked about in the morning. Till today, uh, these proposals uh, have been approved, around 115 proposals of the states and center. Here also the maximum number of proposals of the state government is from Karnataka, which have been approved. There had been some delays, we'll talk about that we, we must uh, appreciate there are certain constraints uh, we have in our uh, headquarter team because you know it is processed through mighty we'll talk about a little bit later the next two provisions are not for the states these are the provisions for the central government number one is 47 under the 47 uh, provision we mentioned about mandatory uh, authentication nowhere we use the word mandatory so mandatory word in the whole of other act has been used only once under section 47 where in the pan linking with Aadhaar and currently the social security code has been passed. They have been passed by the parliament of India. 44B1, and the current one you must be doing, the election commission of India also is that uh, they have passed the act under what the voter IDD linking is happening. So all the bank entities, all the regulatory bodies are using Aadhaar authentication using 44B1. Again, it is voluntary. So out of these three, four, 47 is purely mandatory, 47 is near mandatory the way it has been now designed and what government of India and government all the state governments are expecting the same that way we have also designed our notifications so the individual will be required to undergo other other authentication or he may be asked to provide proof of identity that as a proof of position of other in case the person individual is not having other earlier in the, in the act it is still mentioned in the provision that he has to make an application Currently, in the no current uh, circular which we have issued by UID headquarters, we have issued, we have removed that part. Essentially, we are talking about that he will be offered some alternate ID, alternate and viable means of identification documents. These provisions are intact. These provisions have to be followed. In the morning, also, our DDG sir spoke about. Now, three things we need to keep in mind that post Supreme Court judgment, uh, mm, what happened? Supreme Court in the three judge majority bench has repeated repeatedly in the judgment, if you, if you may see, look at the judgment, they have qualified that what is benefit. So three terms we use, service, benefits, and subsidy. The judgment said they have held that benefits should be those which have the color of some subsidy, essentially which are meant for social welfare schemes and targeted towards the deprived or marginalized class of people. So that has been amply clarified uh, in number of times in the judgment. In the second part is that anything which is earned by an individual, this was related to one that writ petition in the uh, Karnatak High Court by Major Bhombarte, I think you might be aware of that, during that time 2016-17, Department of ex Servicemen Welfare under Ministry of Defense issued a circular, Section 7 notification in May, in February 2017. Uh, we were of course uh, processed that one, that time it was uh, allowed that all military uh, defense personnel who are retired to avail their, to get their pension, they have to provide Aadhaar. So it was challenged in the Karnataka High Court, which was transferred to the Supreme Court, and it was a batch of petitions. And in that regard, Supreme Court said that anything which is earned by an individual, like pension, honorary, or salary, they cannot be called as a benefit and cannot be under covered under Section 7. The third part is the children, the one we have already, our uh, DDGs had already mentioned. We have introduced 303 uh, on section uh, in, in other amendment act which was passed in 2019. Therein the children cannot be denied. The, any child cannot be denied any benefit for want of other. So that is a development post 2019. Now, why do we need notification? Now in the beginning when other act was passed in 2016, during that period, some debates were happening across central ministries that uh, and then some states are also uh, you know get, getting into that passing of their state other act including government of Karnataka. So why do we need notification? Because since provisions are there, anybody can start using other authentication. A conscious decision was taken after lots of debates with Ministry of Law and Justice, 
Ministry of uh, Electronics, our PNN Ministry, UIDI, and DBT Mission Cabinet Secretariat that some standard procedure and process has to be followed and some statutory order has to be issued in the Gazette by the concerned ministries and departments. So in 2016 September, first notification in the form of circular was issued by Ministry of PNG for LPG subsidy. Later on, you call it PAHEL scheme. It was in September. It was in a very brief, but all the provisions which are there currently in the notification, all were there, but they are not in Gazette notification. So 2016 November, Mighty issued a circular to all the central ministries that henceforth all the ministries they have to notify a section 7 notifications in a standard template and that whole process will be facilitated by UID headquarters. So we became the nodal and incidentally myself I had been part of this process since day one and I have been you know, processing all the schemes of central ministries around 50 ministries we have saturated till last to last year. So that time a decision was taken, a standard template was devised uh, with, the, with, with the concurrence of the Ministry of Law and Justice, our legislative department. We became the nodal and till this year June, I think till June the same information around 315 schemes, one or two schemes have been denotified, not, not, they have been withdrawn like Department of Ex Service and Welfare, the pension scheme. All major centrally sponsored schemes which are applicable in the states, all states are all notified. And for those notifications which are already issued by the central ministries way back in 2017, except a few of them like PM Kisan, uh, PM Seva Nidhi in the recent one or two years, all are notified and they are all applicable as of today. So post-2019, when the other amendment act was passed, UIDI headquarter, we issued a circular. We felt that now the for again the same kind of process which we followed for the central ministries, same kind of standardized process needs to be followed by all the states and UTs. Otherwise, uh, it, it may happen so that, you know, that compliance issues about the provisions which are there in the other act and our regulations may not be adhered to. And UIDI being the, uh, you know, main stakeholder of the other act will be part of this, you know, if, if there is any litigation, any complaint or anything will be part of that process. So our duty was to ensure that some standard process is followed by all the states and UTs and we issued a circular. Our former CEO, Sri Pankaj Kumar sir, he, uh, you know, we took uh, to concurrence of the legal division and we issued a circular and we used the two templates. We actually shared two basic templates. One template is for adult beneficiaries more than 18, another for children who are less than 18. Before Supreme Court judgment and before 2019, there was only single template. It was used for both the children as well as adult beneficiaries. So these circulars were issued in 2019, 25th November, and we issued the circular all states, chief secretaries, copied to our regional offices. This is the circular, and uh, that circular had two templates. Now I'll briefly talk about, it will be little boring for those uh, who do not get into the drafting of any notifications, <laughs> because it is little uh, official kind of things, but uh, you need to bring to your notice that when we draft, you, of course, uh, most of the things have been already notified but to bring to your notice that the notification has been designed in a way uh, which are being used by all the central government ministries till today that two uh, elements the benefits what benefits you give under the scheme and who are the targeted beneficiaries these two have two have to be clearly mentioned and defined in the notification second third point is the implementing agency which was important for the central sector schemes as you know central sector schemes are mostly you know, implemented through some autonomous bodies, some other agencies. So that mention has to be made, that has to be mentioned because there is a provision under Regulation 12 where the implementing agency's role is important. Uh, two templates, as you said, and these notifications, after they are drafted, they have to be vetted through their state legal departments formally, and after the vetting, with the approval of the competent authority, they have to be published. In the central ministries, the competent authority is even not secretary, you will be surprised that all the notifications till last to last year, because now one or two notifications are getting issued, all have been approved by the cabinet or minister of state. So it's ministers have approved and then only it has gone to the press for publications. Okay, now one, one important point I just missed out that some of the states actually, you know, they have issued, uh, reissued the notifications which have been issued by the central ministries way back in 2017. They are all centrally sponsored schemes. If there is an, even if 10% share of state or 60% share of the state is there. But if there is some st share of the st central government, that responsibility of issuing that notification is of the central government, not the state. That can be checked with the concern department in the ministry, whether they have issued or not issued. Okay, now 
these are the well drafting as I said that benefits what benefits as I said in the Supreme Court judgment it is clearly mentioned it has to have some subsidy in color subsidy in nature uh, and who are the beneficiaries the very important to understand that if the beneficiaries are whether they are individuals can we identify that in that particular scheme individual it is beneficiary oriented scheme and it individuals are involved because we will be asking other from them in case of you know housing like housing schemes that the scheme is only for the families you know households so PMAY when it was not it was adopted in 2016 December it was shared with us they actually said that household no there is family so our CEO former CEO Dr. Ajibhushan Pandey you know, we, you know without understanding you know we processed he pointed out very clearly Saroj you tell me uh, who is the individual here in this scheme it's not clear even they didn't notify because in the in, in the in the implementation guidelines also it is not mentioned somebody in the household whose other you will ask for that is the basic question when you, when you send back the file proposal to the ministry of rural development Avas Yojana, they also they had to know basically you know revise that the head of the household or a designated member of the household every household members are now required to provide Aadhaar to avail PMOI Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana scheme so those are the some small small things and many of the in cases earlier cases and in the currently also in the states the notifications which are being referred to us in many many schemes this particular thing is missing we are really can't understand who is the beneficiary who is the individual beneficiaries involved or not by only by looking at the name of the scheme it is not possible for us to identify then one has to go into the website and look at the scheme one important important thing we must bring to your notice the templates which we shared in 2019 that was designed in a way that any department can drop the notification within the span of 10 to 15 minutes. Just two paragraphs have to be modified giving the name of the scheme, who is the department, who is the implementing agency, what benefits are given and who are the beneficiaries, that's all. Everything is standardized including the punctuation, semicolon, colon, you know the legal notifications have certain provisions about the colon, semicolon, full stop, they are used in a different manner. So, both word files and the pdf files were shared we wanted to actually give an orientation all the states during month of january february 2020 unfortunately it got delayed and the covid came we could not do that from 2020 march onwards we had organized several vc you know meetings with the states and our aus and kuas across the states through vc meetings but unfortunately i must say the IT, IT professionals or the IT managers, they actually join those programs, not our department officials. Had they joined those VC meetings during this kind of orientation, which we did in way back in 2020, March onwards, perhaps the kind of <laughs> deficiencies which we observed over the last one and a half year referred to us, we had to point out many states, including Kerala, they had to amend the notifications. I'll bring to that uh, slowly. Uh, and another important part was that, that, that the notification was designed in a way that it has to be scheme specific. It is not that all schemes together you write in one place and give an annex search, it's not. Because then that some of the things will be diluted. In central government, no department except where the scholarship schemes are there, they are clubbed. But otherwise no department is clubbing all those schemes together in a single scheme. It is not ease of doing <laughs> business, it is it's a required for that particular provision the way we have designed the template and it is the law ministry has vetted. So beneficiaries in case similar type of beneficiaries we can make otherwise clubbing is not should not be should be avoided. Here in case of Karnataka I will just come to that because nodal department has taken the responsibility of notifying the schemes on behalf of others that is different. You have not clubbed all the schemes but there is a state I will not name them they have actually clubbed over 150 schemes of 35 departments in a single notification giving an annexure. We had to point out, we tried to convince them as polite as possible. Our role as UIDI is to tell you that compliance things. It has to be complied with as per the provisions. Later on, if there is some problem, legal issues, other things, then it will be raised and people will ask what UIDI did in this case. Did they actually share their comments, you know, kind of thing. Okay, now what is the template? Template is very simply, it starts with a preamble kind of thing. Why do we need Aadhaar? You know, RTI also sometimes the question asked, Why do we need Aadhaar? This is the response. The Aadhaar is basically as an identity document, it brings transparency, is, uh, you know, it's ease of, basically ease of living as you say, enables beneficiaries to get their entitlement directly. The Aadhaar link bank account, as I said, 
financial address so you can get your uh, benefit directly without giving any other document. So this is a preamble kind of thing which can be used by us in the departments when the RTI application comes. It is there in our website also. With this, we start with our notification and these two paragraphs which we mentioned uh, in the other slide, these are the uh, two, two paragraphs have to be modified by the concerned department. And on behalf of concerned department, if I am making the notification, I have to have a clear understanding of the scheme objective, name of the scheme, of course it is available in the, even, uh, in, in the budget documents it is available, but the objectives, who are the beneficiaries and who, what benefits we give. These two paragraphs have to be modified, then we conclude saying that recurring expenditure for this scheme involves the recurring expenditure, sometimes maybe non-recurring, some hours, some uh, non-recurring can be happen also, it is consolidated fund of the state, the government of Karnataka or that has to be mentioned. I'm just a small example wherein both cash and kind, as you know the DBT, our uh, uh, Deputy Secretary sir is here from DBT Mission, he will be speaking about. The DBT, the definition of DBT has been broadened, so both cash as well as in-kind benefits are called as DBT. Here in this example on department industries, they were implementing one scheme called Entrepreneurship Development and Skill Upgradation Scheme. That we call it is a scheme in bracket, scheme, because in, in, the, in the template, in the, in the notification, these definitions in the brackets are very important because later on we don't mention about the scheme, we only refer as a scheme. That's why it is in bracket. Then what is the objective? Small objective. It is basically providing skill upgradation, marketing assistance to the small business owners to remain self-employed. Semicolon, not full stop, it is semicolon. Second paragraph is that, and whereas under the scheme, skill training with the stipend. Skill training is in-kind benefit, stipend ulko dete hai, that is cash benefit. So both are together called benefits. And then who are the uh, uh, individual beneficiaries? The trainees. Who are the trainees? Unemployed local youth, artisans, members of the self group groups. We have not called self help members, the individual members. And we have called individual entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs can be also some entity, you know, we are calling it individual entrepreneurs. They are together called as beneficiaries and we are ending with a terminology called extend scheme guideline. In case your scheme guidelines later on get modified because of certain, you know, benefit or some target groups, it can still continue because you are saying extend scheme guidelines. And finally, we are calling that it is coming out from the consolidated from the state. The other paragraphs are very simple. They are all standardized now from the provision of section 7, the state government is drawing the power and notifying said, saying that an individual who is eligible, who is eligible for receiving the benefit, shall hereby, we are using called shall here, it's almost, it's mandatory, be required to furnish proof of position of Aadhaar or he or she will undergo Aadhaar authentication. The second part is important, it is talk about the enrollment, whether the individual is entitled for Aadhaar enrollment as per section 3 of the Aadhaar Act. Third is that important, as I said, implementing agencies ka role ajata is me because the department who is implementing this scheme, they have to ensure that nobody is denied. Basically, nobody, if somebody doesn't have the other, then he, the department will provide the other enrollment facilities in consultation or you can get the support of UIDI. This provision is important. This provision is next to that, this provision is basically alternated and viable means of identification. What we are saying, in case the other is not there, other is not there. Uh, is not assigned to the individual, benefits will be given to that individual based on what? Other enrollment ID. Here we have in 2017 notifications, you will see that there is an one line call, they can apply for, ap they can apply for other. That has been removed post 2018 because almost 99% adults are all covered. So other is there everywhere except a very few pockets. Otherwise other is there uh, with everybody. So and any of these, some of the states, they have removed this part in and when you remove this and because of their own understanding then this becomes separate you know either you give EID or without EID you can give any other document. So these are very small small things at the time of drafting and at the time of vetting also you need to look at and any of these documents we have standardized the document based on our central government schemes any state schemes where your requirement or any identity document is required you can always add so this is up to the concern department or uh, to make because any other document is specified you can specify it is not that everything has to be used like this right and this has to be supposed to be checked by the 
concerned uh, designated officer. The next part is important is the publicity. I think uh, our DDGs are also telling that most of the cases in central government schemes, it happened so in 2017, I have no hesitation to tell in front of even our DVD mission deputy secretary, 2017, uh, most of the central sponsor schemes are notified within a span of three months. Target was 30 March, 30 March 2017, but I think by April, May, 90% of the major central sponsor schemes are notified. Can you imagine till today, our authentication division receives requests from some of the state governments requesting for survey code in respect of those schemes which were notified in 2017. So it essentially that the central government as well as state governments, perhaps even the notification has been issued, it has not percolated down to the even the states or the down the line. So the requirement of the survey code was to be made in 2017 itself, which is still coming to us referring to the notification. So this, this is very important, particularly at the village level, uh, panchayat level, any, any scheme which is at the grassroots level, uh, they must be told that now onwards you have to provide other, this is the requirement in a simple form. Because gadget notification will be on the gadget, it can be used by government officials, general public will not know. Uh, and the section three, this para three is very critical. It has come out after Supreme Court judgment 2018. We actually made an affidavit through our AZ in the Supreme Court that nobody will deny it because of authentication failures. So that was an affidavit. Because of that, we have mentioned that time also phase authentication. In case authentication fails, in case of senior citizens, manual laborers, it can happen, networking, many other reasons. So we'll go for uh, iris scan or phase authentication. Phase authentication was envisaged in way back in 2019 itself. Uh, and in case that also doesn't work, then we'll go, by, uh, go for OTP based authentication. Even if it doesn't work, then we'll go for QR based authentication. QR based verification, not authentication, I'm sorry. So these are all their part of the notifications which are issued post 2019. And the last one is about exception handling mechanism, wherever the authentication fails or there is no other, what you have to do? DBT mission in 2017 itself issued a detailed circular wherein one of the circular uh, issued in respect of PDS, that time the most of the criticism and uh, the appeals were there in because of PDS. The, the denial of food and there was a news, uh, you know, media in the, in the media, a lot of, lot of criticisms. So during that time, Department of Food and Public, the, the PDA has actually issued the circular and followed by that UID also issued a circular. Then DBT mission also detailed circular, a comprehensive circular issued in 2017. It's there in the website. This is also part of the notification. And the lastly, the effectiveness. Some of the states, uh, some of, I don't know, it's basically small, uh, the effectiveness line was missed out. Now coming to our uh, government of Karnataka. So in 2021 uh, uh, last year during COVID time till August we got almost you know, 25 over 25 30 uh, notification hard copies were shared with us. Uh, we looked at that and uh, we found that you know uh, the department has been uh, made nodal to issue the notifications. But uh, to our surprise we found that uh, uh, none of the notification followed our guidelines not the template. So uh, there was a complete deviation from the template. Uh, I'm sorry to say that. Uh, I think there is some, some kind of communication gap in terms of you know, understanding of the uh, requirements in that notification. I think there was no such consultation also due, due, due to COVID. And we also could not you know, have some you know, uh, review meetings with that, with, with immediately, with immediately on that. So uh, these are the notifications which were referred to us. You know, their format was these first two paragraphs are actually coming out from the section seven notification section seven clauses in the other act. And then uh, nowhere it is mentioned that uh, the expenditure is coming from consolidated fund of the state of government of Karnataka. Benefits and beneficiaries from here we can't see because they are not defined basically. The way it has been devised, I think uh, maybe uh, state legal department might have advised that schedule A, schedule B and schedule C maybe in a different form because this is the uh, only case where we have seen this kind of format which have been used. Uh, alternate ID documents, they have been taken into account. Consent form is not part of the notification which have been added. But most importantly, uh, the benefits, beneficiaries, and the constituted fund, the state, that declaration is not there. The regulation 12 has not made in mention, which was actually man mandated uh, that in case somebody doesn't have other what the department has to do. They are basically the legal requirements. So 
these hard copies were shared with us. This was issued in way back in 2020 December, so uh, during COVID time. Uh, another one I would just point out here that uh, when you say constituted of fund of the state, as you know, which are passed in the budget, so chief minister relief funds or the prime minister relief funds, mostly they are not constituted of fund. They are all based on donations. So they are not covered under section seven. Another fund is welfare funds, you know, welfare funds for the construction workers, which are generated through the, you know, the buyers and the builders they provide. Those funds are also not constituted of fund. Some of the states have issued the section seven notifications not mentioning that constituted of fund, but they have mentioned the welfare funds under the welfare board. There is no constituted fund. They are not applicable under section seven. And like a loan, these are all there. So some of the notification, they have followed, you actually the, the template has been followed uh, exactly the way all the, all the schemes have been notified this way. And uh, our comments, uh, we shared the comments in August 2021, um, uh, then our ADG, uh, Mr. Dasser was there and uh, we could not actually have a meeting with your team, but that meeting happened in March this year. We had a meeting uh, with your team, Central uh, Center for E-Governance team. Uh, we found that, you know, they are not a benefit and beneficiaries are nowhere defined. And we found that some of the scheme actually not applicable because some of them are reimbursable like some travel, uh, you know, expenses. They are not section seven benefits. They are all reimbursable things, DA, all those things. They are all there. Some of the scheme are there. Uh, and uh, this particular, as I said, this is this statement has to be clearly mentioned that particularly the scheme is uh, expenditure is coming out from the consolidated fund. Except first is that, second is this, his uh, or her birth proof, and second is the relationship, relationship with his parents or guardians. Some states are trying to, uh, not tried, they have already tried, uh, in front of you I must tell you, uh, they have actually made parents as beneficiaries and they are asking parents other card because children are not mandatory. So if the, in the scheme says that for this particular scheme, benefits are going to the children, but beneficiaries are parents, then you are, it's fine. But if it is till the time it is not, then when you are individually child and you are getting other of the parent because other doesn't prove the relationship. Other cannot prove that you are my parent or you are my daughter or you are my son. So that problem can come. So that we also, you know, offer our comments, but uh, it's up to the state government to take a call. Uh, so relationship, uh, and then the one clause which we mentioned in 3A3. This 3A3 clause is here. In 2019, one department, uh, internal trade, uh, Gujarat make uh, one scheme was called Solo Workers Scheme. Uh, there, their children were get some stipend, you know, Solo Workers Scheme. So that notification was, forwarded to us, we send it to the law ministry. Law ministry immediately made a comment, the legislative department, that it is not required because section 383 says it is not mandatory. Then they asked to seek comments from the Department of Legal Affairs. So we, we went back to the legal affairs. Legal affairs suggested that if you can draft this way, this provision if you make, then it is fine. It is not mandatory, but still you can ask for other, particularly scholarship schemes, as you know, you can ask for other, but your Notification is very clear, nobody will be denied. So there is provision is there. That's all and couple of points, uh, common errors which you observe. In the last one and a half year, since 2020, the first draft was referred to us in 2020, January from B government of Bihar and that was basically for welfare fund, workers fund. Second was from Odisha. So from 2020 January till few months back, around 500 notifications published or draft have been referred to UIDI either for comments or for seeking survey code. So when it comes for survey code, they are examined uh, by us to see that whether compliance has been made and we share comments uh, through emails and we request for amendment. Once the amendment is made, then only we issue the survey codes. So these were, these were the common errors. The last one, uh, before I go to the section 44B2, I'm taking a little bit time, extra time. Uh, the 11th August, we have issued the circular. Many of the states, when you issue the certificates, there is an element of subsidy. So a decision was taken and uh, that uh, issuing of certificate can be covered under section seven. This circular we have issued on 11th August this year. Now I come to SWIC rule that uh, in the morning already we have talked about. What is this, uh, this rule about now? The purpose is very important here. In the presentation made by ma'am and also I think before uh, our CEO said, the purpose you have taken proof of identity. Proof of identity is not purpose. The purpose is that good governance purpose. You know, that has to be mentioned. Even section seven purpose is 
proof of identity, but what service the, to avail that service is important. In case of 44B2, purpose is any of these three, mostly coming under good governance, either social discipline. Well, here your requirement is not considered fund of state, that is one. Second is that if it is not applicable under section seven, then one can go for. But the rule says, sub rule says that this authentication is purely on voluntary basis. Now for this, there is a standard procedure. Uh, we are trying to streamline, sir, I, uh, before you, I must tell you, uh, my T and all of us, our ministry and all of us, we are also, that a lot of requests are coming. It's taking time. Taking time because of one reason, I'll just come to that. So there is a standard application format. Guidelines are available. And this application has to be submitted to our secretary, Ministry of Electronics and IT, not to UIDI. Our role, UIDI's role, to help you and facilitate the drafting. But the, the proposal has to be sent to the secretary mighty directly. And these are the requirements in the proposal. And in, when we actually ask for revision or, so most of the proposals which come to us not having those details. So that is the reason it actually get, it's get delayed. Uh, the description of the initiative or service, what service you want to provide and why authentication you are getting used. Uh, rule three, that justification has to be given the purpose. The purpose has to be clearly mentioned under which purpose it is coming. What kind of authentication services? You have to have an AUA uh, agency or KUA agency with you. Technical architecture has to be provided and service delivery process. Now herein I must tell you, section seven notifications can be drafted by any government official having little bit understanding of the scheme and the template is available in 10 minutes time. In one day we can draft all the scheme notifications. But 44B2 cannot be drafted in a, by a government official without having support of the technical team. So technical team has to provide the support to develop your proposal. That is the differentiation between these two. Uh, some of the use cases, uh, I think I have missed out roots and it. Uh, unique health ID has been issued uh, in the last two years you know, by National Health Authority using 44B2. Uh, Ministry of Road Transport is using for uh, using driving license. IRTC also started using. Many of the states, including Ministry of Railways, they have uh, used other 44B2 voluntary for their computer-based uh, you know, uh, test to verify identity of their candidates. Procurement automation system. Some of the uh, scheme actually under cover section seven, it has been covered in, in your state of Karnataka, which are actually not section seven. When you are procuring something, uh, automation system, that benefit is not there. You basically, they, you are purchasing, so that is covered under 44B2. Many of the states have issued the notifications under 44B2. Uh, document registration and the attendance of employees. That's all from me. Thank you. Huh? Any questions? I would like to have any questions or we can stop. Thank you, sir. Yeah. About uh, expenditure coming out of the consolidated fund of the state. state. Right, sir. Now, section 7, if we read, what it says is that Either it can come from the consolidated fund, of fund, fund, or it can go into the consolidated fund. Therefore, uh, so uh, it need not only be the subsidy. Anything which is which has to accrue to the state also can be covered. So this is something which uh, we have. Uh, 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 the one I presented is the, uh, the kind of legal opinion we have received during 2018-19 after the judgment. And based on the legal opinion of our uh, legal team, uh, legal advisors, uh, the circular on 25th November which we issued essentially talks about this and referring to that. Because post-2018 judgment, many of the scheme notifications, I must tell you like Urjuna Awards, Dronacharya Awards, a professor emeritus, uh, you are appointing, you want to give salary. They're not covered under section seven. In general, we can be called benefit or something. So when we actually look at the judge, look at those notifications drafted with our legal opinion, I'm not a legal person, we actually got the opinion, then we said it is not applicable. So that is the only uh, thing we can say. That can be, debate can be made, but uh, that is a legal opinion we have received in 2018, 19. Huh? Oh, Sir. What the secretary sir says is actually not only those who are benefiting out of consolidated fund, but also those uh, whose, uh, where the collection goes into uh, consolidated fund of the state okay, are also okay. covered. But okay. that basically means that all the taxpayers of the state, like uh, so any GST payer, we can ask them to identify themselves through other, if necessary. GST is covered under already 44B1, yes. Uh, 
Four four B one the central yeah. government has issued. Okay, state. Uh, state. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. even if you don't issue under four four seven also. Right. Uh, right under section yes. seven also they can say, okay. because the funds going into the consolidated fund are also covered here. So both ways it is covered. Mm. That actually this is a unique case because this has not been referred to us by any state. It's unique case. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And one more. This one is it. Whatever the deviations you have pointed out, yes, it all were there. Uh, prior to March 22. Yes. So uh, now, after March, we have amended all the this is a template we That's have made have. in com compliance with uh, all okay. the points uh, which are made. So now we will not see any uh, deviations and corrections. Only thing is That's that it's that some of the some of the scheme maybe maybe re re looked at uh, where section seven you know, the chief minister relief fund uh, perhaps uh, those things because some people can you know can can, can make a point and then later on that can be a problem. Otherwise, all are fine. It can be amendment can be made. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Sorry. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Amrut Kadam, sir. I'm come from medical education department, sir. I just want to explore. Uh, for example, we do not have a longitudinal data about our students who are graduating or studying from our state and who are attending uh, professional uh, courses also. How are they migrating? Are they present in our own state or outside? Is there a way we can use other database to authenticate all our things and combine these databases? Mm -hmm. Sir, Is there I any other way? I, I'm based on your presentation. I understood that it is not possible. Is there another way to do this uh, using this other database? No, uh, sir. We will give you a solution. Uh, Aadhaar will not give you a solution, but what we will do is that we have used Aadhaar and we have built uh, additional add-on uh, uh, no systems, which will uh, provide you the perfect solution. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, your question is that you practically want to track, track. the... Uh, yes. Yes, that is simply not, not possible not with Aadhaar database. Because that's a unique ID where... Uh, no, 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 no. You can uh, try through your state government, but Aadhaar will not help there. Okay. We are part because of we are, we are, we are uh, prohibited from tracking. Uh, before I conclude, just last one point I missed out. Uh, mm, uh, Government of India DBT mission has already, you know, requested all the states uh, within next one or two months. If there is any left out scheme, uh, which can be covered either on under Section 7 or 442, our request to all the states, departments, if you can review your schemes and get it done within next one or two months. Because uh, the mandate is that within next couple of months, it has to be saturated. So purpose of this workshop also was to request you to look into your scheme or any specific service, either section seven or 442. Yeah, sir. Huh. Okay. Myself, Shakil Ahmed. I am Joint Director of Articulture and uh, Project Director of Roads in CEG. Yes, sir. So I have uh, one uh, clarification, one and related to it. Uh, this EID, uh, Enrollment ID, can be one of the alternative document to other. Can it be the only alternative document or it should be along with any other uh, no, ID? EID, we do not call it alternate. Uh -huh. EID plus is the alternate. EID plus should be there. Plus. Uh, we now cannot, a IEID alone cannot be an no. alternate. Okay, no. number one. Ca ca do you have uh, uh, validation services for EID also? Because that we have seen that uh, some junk number is I being know. entered so into EID, databases. Uh, in, 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 the, in 2019, uh, first request was from uh, our national scholarship. There is a national scholarship portal, as you know, monitored and guided by DBT mission. Uh, they are the children and adults, those who are adults, they also provide and many of the time they say that they don't have other, they want to bypass. So th when they provide EID, EID is not authenticated, EID is verified, that service is already available. And API in during 2020 January, with the help of our uh, you know, tech center, our, the API was developed and that API was shared only with National Scholarship Portal our NIC team, that has been integrated. And later on, Konata government also requested for that API. It has been also shared with you. So that, that API to verify whether this EID is valid or not, what is the status? It will reveal the valid or not. And if it is valid, what is the status? If other has been generated, other will not be shown, but the message will come. That, that API is already there. Okay, e uh, with EID, we cannot get back the other because after one month, you would have issued other. Sir. In the database, we require other ultimately because that is the unique ID. So is there a service or 
you are planning to give that service. That will be a very bad thing. That demand is there, uh, basically from NSP, uh, that has still not been, you know, it's getting worked out. Maybe I don't know whether it's possible because both are different servers, you know, EID and authentication servers. EID is not authentication, so our system is different. I think our DG sir can speak about, I'm not the technical person to talk about. Yeah. Enrollment number. Right, sir. Huh? Now, enroll, using enrollment number, I have identified that person and then I have provided the service. And uh, this person again will come for recurring benefits. Another EID, huh, right. Right. So, that time, it would have, enrollment would have become an uh, Aadhaar, right, now already Might enrollment. have already happened, but he's not. Yeah. Yeah. So, correct. So, I should be able to link. So, that's what he is asking. So and this service uh, should be provided. And more importantly, we will need Aadhaar for as a service, as a financial address also. This See, also after a registration, unless I have Aadhaar, mm -hmm. I will not be able to pay him. So with EID, I have already registered, and again I have to ask for Aadhaar with him when okay. I am paying. Bank I cannot so much to pay to him. So yeah. the, for both purposes, one is for updating my database. The DBT the account other, cannot be created. Yes. And yes. Aadhaar as a uh, financial survey, financial address, I yeah. need that Aadhaar. So uh, we request that uh, EID, uh, given an EID, if Aadhaar is already issued, share back the Aadhaar. No, we cannot do that. Mm -hmm. we, uh, so what is the answer? Th this, was the, this was the contention between our office and the uh, government of Karnataka. Okay. Basically, see, your purpose is to identify a beneficiary. The beneficiary turns up and he says he doesn't have an Aadhaar, but yes. he has an EID. So now EID, EID is valid only for 90 days. So you can give him once, no problem. Next time he comes in and says again, uh, I don't have Aadhaar. You ask him what happened to your VAD. Exactly. It should have either fructified into an Aadhaar or it should have been rejected. Right? So when you are collecting EAD from somebody, my, my request would be please collect the bank passbook details also because that is an eligible document for Aadhaar. Exactly. That is what we mean by EAD plus. Take EAD and take another ID, throw preferably a bank account passbook, to which you can deposit directly. See, we do not do that. Uh, this was the issue with the government of Karnataka. We gave the simple answer. See, we have enrollment agencies. We have a uh, lot of enrollment agencies. They enroll and give the data to us. We don't give them back whether it was a successful Aadhaar. No. If it is successful, what is the Aadhaar number? These details are never given never. back to the EA. Yes. OK. So is it possible to give, sir? No, is there any need legal uh, impediment no. or uh, it is just There is a legal impediment because we, I need the consent of that other owner to share your data. I can't share the, hmm. If you take the consent and give, sir? Again, again. Along if with the EID, I take the consent to share back. Then you please take the EID from him and uh, verify from our database directly. Sir, actually, the, EID, the problem with the EID is that one person can avail multiple EIDs. And oh. here also, there are multiple documents which can be avoid, given. So the same person can give different documents for the same scheme and he can. And we are actually giving a benefit because he has not been assigned an other. Otherwise, you, you should, as per section 7 notification, if he is an assigned an other, he should give the other number. So the solution is for the state government to stipulate that we will use EID only once. But again, the, how do we come to know whether that person has given multiple, he can give, come with again one more EID, no? How do you identify a person uniquely? He'll be coming to the same office for the same hmm. benefit, right? He's not he can go to any citizen service center and avail the benefit. He can go to one service, uh, service center, give one EID seconds. But the, but the service will be rendered through the concerned jurisdiction, right? No, Some, no. Somebody from Tumukuru, for example. He's not going to go to Mysuru and then no, apply Tumpur from there. also there are different, different service centers. Application. Huh. But the benefit will be given by the same office. But benefit will be given by the address he has given, right? No, I can so enroll from Tumukuru, but I'll say that my residential address is Mysuru. Please give me the benefit at Mysuru. Huh. He can create multiple IDs. Now see, one voter ID will be from Tumukuru, one voter ID from uh, one uh, ration card from Bangalore. You, will, you can submit. See. How will you identify that? So you please ask him to identify through other documents. That's what he will give multiple do documents. The question is, the question is, we will never share what other has been generated out of which EAD because it's a violation of privacy, uh, obviously. No, sir. Actually, Section Seven, based on the EAD only, we are giving the uh, approval, na? Right. We so didn't. We see, didn't because tell he, he has he has enrolled for an other. That is the purpose we are giving. That will be only once. 
Haan, but you if, if the fellow comes back again after three months and gives another ed you reject him that's all how we'll not come he, to he, he's going to give you the same name right he's going to give you the same name sir name there are same name will be different different person will have same name sir demographics will be the same demographics will be the same right his name is going to be the same no, no, where no. he is residing is going to be the same sir in one village shrinivas appa there will be four five shrinivas appa in the same village sir that is okay other three shrinivas appas will have other only one shrinivas appa will have ad right? i think i think no. uh, sir uh, we are very very clear uh, we will never share other detail with ad that cannot be done even to a state government that has been very very clearly said but he has not been given scholarship when we checked he had also created another student account using his aadhar for which aadhar uh, a scholarship was paid when we checked he said uh, i had used this enrollment id to create one ssp id and aadhar to use uh, create another ssp id but thankfully because uh, enrollment id will not give me his financial address scholarship was not paid but these complaints when it go to elected representatives and when we say we can't give this uh, facility using his uh, uh, enrollment id they will say use bank account but karnataka has notified all services to be uh, wherever there is cash benefit to be uh, uh, through aeps okay uh, rashmi rashmi and what's up we will uh, right now we will make a request with uh, uh, no uh, other authorities that please provide this till they do that we will make a work around in our system right if someone is providing eid okay what we will do is that we will keep them uh, pending uh, without sanctioning okay maybe uh, 15 days a month after that we will send out a notice we would have anyway captured the mobile number of that person so you send out a uh, uh, message saying that Alert, please sir. come back with your other number for uh, further processing that way we can keep it uh, pending and we can we will do that work around uh, if uh, uh, this is a constraint in the other as of now and what would be the percentage it would be less maybe than 1% maybe right? less than that so for that 1% let us not make this so 1% we will keep it pending uh, and then we will sanction it subsequently it may be exception of exception right? very few cases here sir very that ead service we have not received sir you are telling about the ead service we are requesting we have not received that ead service whatever you have given to N N P N S P N S P we have provided we have not we have not been given sir kindly okay. ask your tech team to provide enrollment. this no no it was it was processed through enrollment and update decision that we have not got okay, sir okay okay yes, sir. just would like to uh, give one uh, submission that uh, what happens if uh, benefit is uh, recurring uh, like beneficiary is coming for again and again for that uh, benefits so mm. what you can do you can red flag that application exactly yeah. we are doing in the national scholarship portal we are red flagging them red flagging. and we are making electronic register where we give the sms to them that this is the enrollment center nearby to you and get make the uh, yeah, that your aadhar enrollment number 1 number 2 is a one of example is pradhan mantri uh, matrit vandana yojana PMA what we do the first uh, installment be released without the aadhar but next uh, installment only after submission of aadhar so that that is the methodology which you can use it third thing is just for example i am giving you the example of recently uh, issued uh, format standard form for the linking of aadhar with the voter id card so that is called nudging you will see the first column they have asked the aadhar number and second column they have asked if you have not assigned aadhar number then only following document this this this, this has to be given so by the nudging also by framing your scheme guideline in such a way that individual has to come through the aadhar maybe he can wait once for a short spell of time but later on he or she has to come on the aadhar then only he will be given easy access to the benefits otherwise you make their life horrible they will automatically come on the platform because we have already reached the saturation level of more than 100% uh, aadhar and especially in your state has very very good uh, you know saturation level so you can force them to come to the aadhar uh, with aadhar because we have also issued the uh, as it has been mentioned in the previous speaker the clarification has been issued by the uidi on 11th uh, august wherein it has been clearly mentioned that when sec uh, when any scheme is notified under the aadhar section 7 individual has to come with the eid and ensure that and the following 12 documents 
which has already been well defined. So when it is EID and that means it, it, it has become almost mandatory and uh, you will be surprised that now within a week Aadhaar is being assigned. So earlier it was a lagging time, time was very uh, much higher because of the higher enrollment. Now new enrollment is very, very less, around 2.5 crores per uh, annum, whereas the updation is too high. So it may be updation, may be different, but Aadhaar number is required. So easily you can get the Aadhaar, Aadhaar is assigned within a week also, almost within a week. So take the EID and next time when it comes, because any scheme you notify it, it takes some time, it is a time for one month or two months. So if you are taking EID within two months, you will get the Aadhaar. So you can make the provision, hardly it will be 0.001% or 0.5, less than you know 1%, right? So for 1% you make a provision, send a bulk SMS to them that you have to submit your Aadhaar and give online submission, let them submit online. Make a provision, it is easily, your, your IT system is also very good, your, your Aadhaar system is very robust, so you can utilize that uh, leeway, you can utilize, leverage the technology to get that Aadhaar number. That is my submission, thank, thank you. you. Very basic Shakil, question. Shakil, see what we will do, this number, enrollment ID, as you said, cases are very less. Okay, very less, very yes, very yes. Less. Even in those cases, what we can do is that Physical. since the uh, uh, conversion from EID to Aadhaar is happening within week 10 days, exactly. what we can keep is that in all the schemes, we are capturing the mobile number of the beneficiary also, mm -hmm. uh, we are capturing. So we can uh, keep this pending for a week, 10 days, uh, not uh, make EID eligible for the entitlement cases, right? Exactly. So uh, oh. only it those is. verification cases, you make this EID. So keep it pending for a week's time, then call out the person, right, who has used, it will be 1% only out of the total application. So ask the person to submit the other number and then proceed further. That would be the uh, only thing is the ID validation service. What service they are looking about that we will require, sir, because otherwise junk number will come. EID number, whether it is correct or not, that service uh, we need to have. It is actually not yes. shared. That, that share. is that Please that share. we thought it was processed through our ENED. I'll just check the number. Please check. I think it is there. I mean, I mean, scholarship. Uh, no, no, scholarship, but government contract made a separate request. See, the authenticity of an EAD can be checked one by one. Mm -hmm. Okay, you are not going to get 10,000 EADs, no. right? One by one, one, by one you can one check it one. in our portal, one by one. number one. And please remember, from EAD, if you go to, if you provide that EAD to any of the centers, they can tell you whether other has been generated or not. Yes. Okay, so you, government of Karnataka has their own centers, right? So you just ask the nearest center follow whether other has been generated for this EAD. Thank you. Done? No, sir. Last one, sir. Uh, <laughs> see, Aadhaar is being used as an identity. Right. Yeah. For a, as a proof of identity, as per the Act and all sections are talking about proof of identity. Uh, we are also using it as a financial address. Is it is actually provided under the Act or it is out no. of box? Financial address is not in the Act. It's so a, on a use case. Under what? Uh, Aadhaar, when Aadhaar is linked with a bank account, that is basically, as I said, Aadhaar is purpose blind. So you are linking uh, Aadhaar with the bank. That provision is coming from PMLA. You know, so uh, that is a service. That is a service. It is what you said again. Again, you just repeat it no, again. Aadhaar to be used as a financial address. We call it Aadhaar as a financial address. We call it. Uh -huh. But this particular thing is not mentioned in our uh, act. Uh, this is one of the service use case. He's, he's asking right. what is the legal basis. There is PMLA. legal basis is PMLA. PMLA, PMLA, and uh, I think our Deputy Secretary Sir will be also talk about during his presentation. I think we can take up little later. Just for information, it is under the PMLA, the PMLA Act, and there is a regulation in the RBI that you where have the Indian uh, Banking Association IBA uh, is make a standard form for all the banking systems, all the banks. So in that bank form, if you go through the bank form, it is defined that if you are desirous to take the benefit of uh, um, uh, that uh, welfare under schemes under, under section, section 7, seven you have to have give to the Aadhaar. And Aadhaar is a uh, financial address, I will address the issue and we will take up the questions. So in under the PML Act also, under the RBI regulations 1935 it is also defined and through the IBA, IBA is a um, Indian Making Association which is a basic uh, re regulating body for all the banks, standardization of the bank and there is a CDD call. Just, uh, that is called customer due diligence. So all bank has the authority 
as a reporting entity to ensure that all the customer who is having the business with that bank to take the authenticate the uh, you know beneficiaries or beneficiary or the customer Equally. so it comes from the three angles right thank you thank you done thank you so much <laughs> thank you i think just use one slide because the state government department people have come here next Is this any more see the process of section 7 and 44b2 in karnataka this is because this is for the audience who are here so dpr e governance has been made the nodal department so the department and there is an empower committee chaired by secretary e governance which actually scrutinizes the proposal of section 7 and even 44b2 so the proposals are scrutinized and the departmental uh, department has to submit their application to the e governance department the scrutiny will be done then that expert uh, committee will then uh, take up this uh, act activity and then approve the uh, section 7 notifications and if it is 44b2 notification they recommend the notification to government of india and based on the approval of the government of india we again issue the 44b2 notification as on today we have issued around 350 section 7 notifications and around 16 section 44b2 notification so this is the process which has to be followed by the department the department has to submit and we have issued circulars and government orders in this regard the format in which the proposal has to be submitted all the informations have been given as part of the circular and it is available in our website so this is the information which i want to just communicate as part of the section 7 notification and 44b2 notification so thank you very much so moving on to the next session we'll be having direct benefit transfer it will be dealt by sri devendra kumar deputy secretary cabinet secretariat sir i welcome uh, devendra kumar sir to take over the session please thank thank you uh, respected uh, senior officials from the state government of karnataka punnu raju sir deju sir and ddg sir both the ddg gopalan sir and anup sir from all, and all the senior officials from the state government and uh, from the uidi headquarter team uh, thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to share the experience and share the dvt ecosystem which is being dealt in the central government and the expectations of the central government from the states in this regard so as the lunch your lunch and uh, you and i in between i am here so i will try to keep my presentation short so that you cannot uh, you know before pre lunch session is always difficult so uh, here i just would like to recap the things which has been told by the sir the uida team has already given you the details about the aadhar act and basically how the aadhar has enabled us as a digital identity one of the largest digital entity in the world in india and we have been able to achieve our target especially the government target to ensure that benefit benefit is uh, given to the targeted beneficiary which is uh, you know accurately targeted so as we all are here Uh, thus, uh, to understand the DVT ecosystem, and UID has already given the uh, basic use of uh, Aadhar and the safeguards available in the Aadhar, and the department's heads has given that what is the expectations of the beneficiary. As Sir has Punura Sir has told that being a collector of Udupi, the expectation from the beneficiary is that the, you should give the benefit on the real time basis on the same day, whereas our systems give the benefit into our Three months, right? So uh, you all, we are here. Most of them, the implementing agencies are here. State government implementing agencies. So we will be see, uh, seeing how we can uh, this Aadhaar 
uses in the DBT ecosystem can make the expectations that can meet the expectations of the beneficiary and how it is an enabler so I will be going through the uh, details of the Aadhaar and uses in the DBT ecosystem next so uh, first of all the we will be going through the DBT history and then how you can identify the scheme whether it is a DBT scheme or not and what are the legal provisions which already been talked here? How you can make the DVT uh, system as a, you know, into uh, inst inst end digitalized, and the benefit you will be uh, getting from the into end digitalization. Apart from that, the benefit of the uh, DVT also I will be discussing, and we will be discussing about the your state Karnataka status in the DVT ecosystem. So uh, basically the DVT was uh, conceptualized in 2013 as a good governance reform initiative aimed at improving public services delivery to ensure that benefits are delivered efficiently and timely. Basically uh, whatever the benefit as sir was told, telling that individual wants to be given on a real time basis. So this is the process, this is the mechanism by which we are able to reach to the beneficiary on a real time basis. Basically, it is a government process re-engineering by which we are able to uh, reach to the beneficiary. It had started in 2012 under the Niti Aayog. Later, it was transferred to the Ministry of Finance. And presently, it is working since 2015 under the Cabinet Secretariat, which, which is uh, basically this DVT uh, cell mission is headed by the Secretary Coordination right now. These are the basic structure of the DVT. So why DVT? We are having the system, every state was a center and a state was following the system and they used to transfer the benefit or the welfare schemes to the their respective beneficiaries. Then why we have moved to the DVT? So first of all, it is we are able to ensure the accurate targeting of the beneficiary. And for accurate targeting, we are having the database available with the Aadhaar. So Aadhaar is a digital entity by which we are using in the DVT ecosystem and we are able to accurately target the beneficiary, right? And the direct benefit transfer, when you are directly transferring the benefit to the individual, it also curbs the pilferage. Like you have seen the Kutumba, which has been given presentation by the Anpurna ma'am, that individual is able to come online, they can do the e-verification through using the Aadhaar and thus it reduces the, you know, goes beneficiaries to remove the middleman when the schemes and when the benefit are given directly to the beneficiary it automatically remove the middleman which is generally uh, taking the benefit of the individual behalf of the particular beneficiaries in the different names right so uh, who is the beneficiary when when you are as a state government uh, implementing agency or the scheme when you are going to uh, you know design a scheme so the question will come then why we should bring the on the dvt and how we can decide that who is the beneficiaries when your scheme is there it may be a, a, school, uh, a scheme which is designed for the individual the scheme may be designed for the group so it is already defined in the aadhaar act 2f that uh, who is the beneficiary? Bas beneficiary, an individual or a group of individual receiving any advantage, relief, payment, etc., in the cash or in kind from the Consolidated Fund of India in the uh, for the central government and for the Consolidated Fund of the state for the state government. It is also it is not mentioned here, but it is uh, for the state also, right? So uh, basically, when you are identifying any scheme or designing any scheme, you see that who is the beneficiary. There is a notion that the DBT can only be given in the case of individual, right? But you might, you can see like the PDS, it is the largest uh, scheme of government of India, but here the beneficiary is full family, right? So DBT can be not only individual based, it can be group based also. Similarly in the, your small help group uh, or the community based group can be the beneficiary and that can also be comes under the DBT direct benefit transfer. So while you're designing the scheme, you must see that beneficiary may be individual as well as the beneficiary may be group of individuals. 
So what does DVT comprise of? Generally, there is another misconception also that only the cash schemes, wherever the cash is given, given that that is only comes under the direct benefit transfer. But you will be uh, the the ambit of DVT has been increased and in kind has also been brought under the ambit of direct benefit transfer. So uh, in kind like the PDAs, the fertilizers, fertilizers, you know, uh, we are having one of the uh, largest scheme under the fertilizers, school uniform, skill development training, this all comes under the in-kind schemes. In-kind, how we do uh, the in-kind benefit we transfer? It is transferred through the authentication of, uh, through the Aadhaar authentication, right? Individual goes to the, uh, you know, fertilizer shops, they go to the POS machine, POS machine, and they authenticate himself or herself, and they get the benefit. Similarly, in the PDS also, they used to get the benefit by authenticating themselves. So uh, legal provision, al already it has been uh, talked about uh, the different aspect of the legal provision. Here I am uh, talking about the implementation part of the legal provisions, right? So uh, the Aadhaar has given the mandate by which Aadhaar is a, the, the Aadhaar Act is an enabler for us as a central government or as a state government by which by notifying the scheme under the different Aadhaar Act, we can collect the Aadhaar numbers, right? So these are the enabling provision given in the Aadhaar Act. So when we, whenever you are notifying your scheme or whenever you are designing your scheme, you can see that it comes under uh, which uh, section of the Aadhaar Act. So generally for the benefit of, uh, benefit which is given to the individuals, the beneficiaries, generally section seven is the major, uh, major section on which most of the schemes are covered. For the state, there is a 44B2, uh, that comes under the good governance ambit. So the scheme which do not comes, uh, do not fall under the ambit of uh, section seven, that can be notified under the 44B2. As sir has raised that question that 44B2 notification takes time. So already uh, the Sarojji from UIDI has told that there is a certain standards, there is a certain norms, there is a certain requirement which required uh, by the central government to to notify under the sections uh, 44B2. So whenever you are sending your proposal for 44B2 to MITI, kindly ensure that that parameters are being fulfilled. That will uh, increase, that will, uh, you know, reduce the time for notification. So section 47, like Aadhaar Act, in uh, Act itself, there is a provision, if central governments wants, they can uh, notify under the, they, they can, you know, formulate uh, law under the parliament and they can make it mandatory. So it is already there in the case of uh, income tax. Um, all uh, we, we are here and we are link our PAN uh, with the Aadhaar. And by Aadhaar you can verify yourself uh, on the income tax uh, platform. So this is mandatory. So government have uh, the power to formulate the um, act and they can make it mandatory also. So this is one of the example, just I am giving it. 44B2, as we have already seen it here, it is uh, not mandatory, but it in the voluntary in nature. But uh, like in major schemes, we have seen that like um, we are taking the examination of RRB, where more than 2.1 crore applicants has appeared. And almost 100% people have um, got uh, biometric attendance done. In daily use also, you do the biometric attendance, it is also comes under the 44B2. So, uh, wherever it is required that it is comes under the ambit of good governance, we can use the 44B2 as a tool to ensure that Aadhaar authentication is being done or, or Aadhaar is being collected, right? So these are the empowering, enabling tool for uh, department, for the ministries to ensure that Aadhaar is being collected. It gives you a legal, uh, you know, empowerment to collect the Aadhaar from the beneficiary, from the individual. Uh, Section 7, it is already uh, told uh, that uh, Section 7 has been uh, recently, clarification has also been issued on 11th August, wherein the section has been even made more, made more uh, the standing has been done on the Section 7. So if somebody, some scheme is notified under the Section 7, so what will happen? Individual has to give the uh, Aadhaar. If he is not assigned Aadhaar, he or she has to give the EID and the following um, one of the following document which has been defined under the act. So that give you the enabling power 
that you ensure that the individual goes to the uh, enrollment center, they get enrolled, they get EID, and they give the uh, to your particular department to avail the benefits, right? So what are the benefit of uh, Aadhaar based DVT? Basically, here I am uh, utilizing DVT based on the Aadhaar. So sir has as, as sir has told, we are having the one of the uh, 1.3 billion population, and by identifying the individual, we do not have any mechanism before the Aadhaar was act, um, uh, come into the picture in 2010. So before that, it was very very difficult for the government department for the uh, state government also, for the center government also to identify the individual. But now the saturation has reached to the almost 100%, more than 100% for the uh, age of, uh, above 18 of the age. So we are, uh, we are having one of the largest depository of digital identity. And this digital identity has a lot of excellent features, which has already been talked about the, uh, uh, that features from the UIDI regional office as from the headquarters also. So digital entity has a lot of uh, benefits. And what are the benefits uh, that digital entity has? That sir has told that different department cannot talk to each other and our administration was running from the Almiras, right? Now, right. And individual has expectation to get the benefit from the real time. So Aadhaar enable us to come to that expectations, give the benefit on the real time, verify the individual on the real time, deduplicate the individual on the real time basis because this is the cost effective way of authenticating the individual, identifying the individual. Say, before the case of Aadhaar, what used to be the basic, of, uh, basic thing of identification? You are, suppose you are working in any department and you have, somebody has got a recruited as a new recruit. So what you used to do? You, uh, before recruitment, we have to do the process of verification. So they are, their 10th certificate, their caste certificate, their income certificate, we all used to send them through post to the individual entity. Like post, we will send to the school for verification of uh, education certificate. We will send the document to the income tax revenue office for the verification of his income certificate. Accordingly, we used to send the other document also for the verifications to identify the individual that he is the, the right person, he has given the right information. But due to inception of Aadhaar, we can authenticate at least individual identity based on the Aadhaar. Because it is a cost effective real time basis and easily it can be verified which has the legal entity also. So um, basically the use of Aadhaar in the DVT has many benefits which includes accurate identification of the beneficiary. You have the database like the Kutumb ID you have got and it has piggy banked on the Aadhaar. So you can accurately identify the beneficiaries easily because of the uh, huge database available with the your uh, government databases. Second is deduplications. Suppose you are getting the applications as it was told in the EID cases. You get the applications of uh, 1 crore in the case of uh, say uh, any any uh, applications, any any schemes, applications for the scholarship application, we are getting 1.28 crores or 1.5 crores of applications. Is it physically possible to do the deduplication based on on the data? It is almost impossible. If it is done, then it will take a lot of time. But in the case of Aadhaar, when you are taking the Aadhaar, the huge database because of the uh, nature of the um, ecosystem of IT. Utilizing the ICT leverages easily we can deduplicate because data do not talk to each other so far. But due to inception of Aadhaar, the data can talk to each other and they can deduplicate. Sir was just before telling that all the files were in the Almiras. So uh, the uh, different files could not talk to each other earlier. But now due to the inception of Aadhaar, all databases of all the department, not only your department, but other department data can also can talk to each other, that is the language of identification. Like uh, we are having the different languages. So to communicate each other, this is the Aadhaar which communicates as a, as a communication tool, it, it is being used to talk to each other in the different databases. So by utilizing the Aadhaar based DVT, we can deduplicate huge number of, uh, large number of databases. And you will be surprised that more than four crores of duplicate ration card across India has been removed, a weed out. 
Accordingly, if you see in the Manadega, there is a 10% of beneficiary across uh, India has been deduplicated due to the uh, deduplication using the Aadhaar, we are able to remove the ghost beneficiaries. In the case of a scholarship, almost 45 lakhs, if seen in the different departments, the more than 45 lakhs uh, application, duplicate application of beneficiary has been removed from the database and removed from the uh, getting the benefits. In the Pahal also, almost 3.9 crore of uh, duplicate or host beneficiary has been removed due to the deduplication. So see uh, the how much benefit and uh, how the game changer it has worked and due to the deduplication, we are able to induct the more uh, people who is really needy. Because when the ghost employees there, the ghost people are there, you cannot take the, uh, the actual beneficiaries. Like every state has been given the fixed uh, number of for the PDS. To include the fresh beneficiary, the actual beneficiary, you require always, uh, you know, when you remove the ghost beneficiary, you are having the slot vacant. So you can easily get the actual beneficiary who is needy. And uh, using this DVT ecosystem, using the Aadhaar, we can reach out to the, especially the person who is excluded from the our ecosystem, the, especially the downtrodden who is very, very, you know, not aware of the schemes and details. We are able, uh, easily able to accommodate them because of the deduplications. It ensures greater inclusion and ease of availing the services. It was very difficult earlier when the PDS system was there, anybody can get the sign done and they can uh, withdraw the ration, they can take the ration. But due to POS systems and other authentications, it is not f physically possible. It is actually not possible, right? So it also ensures that the, your services avail very easily and it also ensures that the better, greater inclusion is being done. Verification is really determination mechanism. So uh, what has happened, the, this is the way by which we are able to verify it. We are going far ahead. Now on the 11th August itself, there was a notification which has been issued uh, by the clarification and uh, OM has been issued by the UIDI headquarter, which says that all the government certificate which has been issued for the eligibility criteria determinations, like you issue the income certificate, residential certificate, the disability certificates, marriage certificate, lot of certificates are being issued. So we have identified 15 or 20 certificates. So that certificate can also be linked through the Aadhaar. So a state can notify and the uh, whenever certificate is being issued that that automatically individual has to give the Aadhaar number because it will be notified under the section 7. So what will happen automatically the, the individual database will be transfer from the revenue office. Suppose I am uh, as an as individual as goes to the revenue office, I wanted to is get issued my income certificate. So I have to give the Aadhaar. So Aadhaar will be linked with the certificate and the document will be transferred electronically in the machine language to the DG locker. If individual has the DG locker, uh, you know, available with him. So in the next phase, we are going ahead and utilizing the Aadhaar as a tool for the certificate also. So far, we are able to integrate many uh, schemes, many uh, you know, uh, eligibility documents on the Aadhaar database, like uh, we are able to get all the state documents, especially the mark sheets, which is required for the uh, national scholarship or the state scholarships, link with the DigiLocker, and now the state has to notify that all the uh, uh, schemes, all the uh, eligible documents uh, issuing authority that, is key, that that particular thing has to be notified under section 7 so that whenever they are issuing the certificates, they invariably take the Aadhaar number from the individual, right? So this will also ensure that individual need not to give any document. We will be able to verify the document based on the source from where it has been originated, being a state. So it also uh, reform the government process. You see, you have already seen your Kutumba, how you are able to get the data, how you are, how you are one department is able to talk to other department and how you can best uh, evidence base or the actual beneficiary based planning you can do. So these are the benefits of the Aadhaar based DVT. It also increased the efficiency in the scheme. Say, uh, like Kutumba you have used and I'm quoting twice or thrice the Kutumba because we have also uh, the head, the, the 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 PMO has taken the presentation on Kutumba also, and it is very very good uh, software available with you people. So how it has increased the uh, efficiency in the government, 
like you are giving the individual to verify himself or herself using the e-sign. So it reduces lot of time to the government department to verify the individual data. You are also giving the authority to the individual to feed their data if they are missing. So everything has the cost. See, uh, earlier what was there earlier just for example I am giving in the railways I basically I am from the railway so I am giving the example of railway. We used to get the applications for the any post where whenever noti uh, vacancy is notified. So suppose you are getting applications of 1 crore. So each application for feeding the data from the physical copy to the database electronically they are typing they used to cost per applications 10 to 30 rupees based on the different different tenders right. So think of 2 crore applications and per applications 20 rupees average you are taking so how much money we are wasting. Second is that when individual is fitting the data he is aware of his all the details his name spelling his father's name spelling his village spelling his pin, pin code right. So he will give the accurate data on the database whereas when the data is fed by the data entry operator there is a chances of lot of errors right. So it not only reduces the efficiency in uh, you know government working but also the efficiency of the system and the credential of data. The integrity of data is also far far better in the DVT uh, Aadhaar based DVT system. And it also empowers the individual. So you are in one go using the Aadhaar you are doing three things right. You are empowering the individual, you are removing the discretionary power of anybody in between and you are having the accurate data and you are getting in, in your efficiency increase, your effectiveness get increased, your time lag is almost finished because it is in the real time basis, right. So because of the DVT based, uh, Aadhaar based DVT we are having so much of benefit. So whenever you are designing the scheme you design in such a way that Aadhaar is being taken um, invariably. So this is the, these are the infographics of the amount which has been transferred. See the almost 6 lakh 30 crore thousand uh, 6 lakh 30 thousand crores has been transferred through the using the DVT ecosystems. This is a non-unique, non-unique means one beneficiary can have the many, many benefit. He can be the beneficiary of uh, PDS, he can be beneficiary of fertilizer, he can be beneficiary of Pranamanti Avas Yojana. So this is the, that's why it has been called non-unique. But see the volume volume is mind blowing because it is 6 lakh 30 thousand crore has been transferred in the this 22-23 this is a provisional data because we are in the uh, September so far. So 2 lakh 37 thousand crore has been transferred and it is transferred seamlessly and directly goes to the beneficiary's account or the benefit is being availed through Aadhaar uh, authentications on the POS machine. So whatever you are saying you are able to get the cap data capture on the real time basis it is bet web services integrated with the different departments and we are able to get the data. So when you are having the data we can easily use the uh, our uh, planning better way. It is a data driven planning and also during the covid period you have seen that 2020-21 uh, it was from 3 lakh 81,000 to it has been increased to uh, 5 lakh 52,000. The Garib Kalyan Yojana we are having the database so directly benefit has been transferred to the uh, Jandhan accounts and it was having the huge impact during the pandemic. So due to the DVT ecosystem we are able to uh, uh, reach out to the beneficiary very easily on the real time basis. Similarly in the PM Kishan Yojana we are able to reach out to the 10 crore farmers very easily and with the Aadhaar authentication more than 95 percent almost. So this is the power of uh, Aadhaar and this is the power of direct benefit transfer we are just utilize I can say hardly less than 10 percent of the Aadhaar uh, potential and I am sure as the things will mature, as the system will mature, as our data will integrate will mature, we will be able to target beneficiary directly based on the entitle or the need base as it has been told and we will also not require any document from the beneficiary in the future, coming future in the DVT 3 that is we are running representing in the DBT2 wherein we are able to use the um, technology. In DBT3 it should be entitled based right. So uh, whenever you are designing a scheme or implementing a scheme as a implementing agency as a government entity 
we must be have the faith on the system we must have the confidence on the system and we must ensure that most of the things comes under the ambit of dvt this is the aadhar seeding just a few data has uh, the, during the 2018 19 due to the supreme court uh, you know case was undergoing that's why it has reduced but again it has picked up and it is a cent only in the central government central details it is available it has reached in 2022-23 more than 86 percent right because of there is a few states like Jammu Kashmir and northeastern state Meghalaya Assam has been given some uh, you know exemptions now they have already removed so we are hoping that in the coming year we will having more Aadhaar seeding or authentications in the different uh, schemes these are the benefit which has occurred due to the DVT you can see um, almost we have reached to the 2.5 2.2 uh, uh, lakh crore rupees the saving has happened due to the DVT ecosystem it has reached to the uh, 2.5 lakhs uh, in the next slide I will be giving the details so how to identify the um, uh, schemes whether it will come under the DVT or not so number one you have to see where the from where the fund is being uh, sanctioned it is from the consolidated fund of a state or not so number one uh, while seeing the schemes you have to see it should come under the consolidated fund of a state if it is from the contingency fund as like the uh, cm relief fund then it can easily be notified under 44b2 if it is coming from the consolidated fund of a state it can be notified under section 7 which enables you as a department to get the aadhar from the beneficiary right if benefit is given so sometimes it happened that uh, like um, say uh, midday meal has been given or school cloth has been given school dress has been given cycle has been given to the individual so that time it will come under dbt or not so it will come because individual can be identifiable so uh, easily it, if it is cash then also if it is kind then also it can be come under the dbt so if uh, the scheme can you can see whether a scheme can be notified under section 7 or uh, section 44 b2 right uh, the if cash is transferred directly to the um, account of the individual then also it will come under the uh, dbt in kind of schemes what what is the mechanism to ensure that it is uh, individually identified it individ individual a beneficiary can be identified can be authenticated using the aadhar right in pos machine so these are the parameters so that by which you can identify whether it will come under the dbt or not so if fund from where fund is coming who is the beneficiary how the fund is being transferred whether it is on account or uh, cash or in kind so if these are the parameters any scheme is coming up so you can easily notify under the section 7 or section 44 b2 so uh, what is the focus on the dbt as a central government uh, the highest office of the uh, government of india is in uh, view that all the government whether it is a center or the state should be brought under the ambit of dbt because it is the um, you know best tool to uh, give the welfare schemes to the needy person to the targeted person accurately effectively and timely manner so the endeavor, uh, endeavor of uh, dbt mission is that we have have the review of all the ministries to include that whatever new scheme has been added they should come under the dvt and whatever old scheme is also running if they have the component of dvt then they should also be brought under the dvt and similarly in the state government has also been uh, persuaded and uh, they have been asked to identify their schemes and they should review their applicability in their state so in karnataka we have 277 state schemes onboarded on the dvt bharat portals and your beneficiary uh, is quite good in the so how we can uh, good practices so uh, many department and ministry has used the good practices so i'm sharing it here like a pm kisan when you go to the pm kisan as a kisan you wanted to register yourself on the schemes so first column comes is the aadhar so similarly whenever you are designing your standard form for the applications ensure that aadhar and like you are having the kutumb id so you can take the second kutum id and first aadhar so designing the scheme you can utilize the tool as a format as a as a uh, good practices to ensure that aadhar is being captured easily and whatever the like somebody is coming with the without aadhar then red flag that applications 
do more verification so what will happen automatically the um, person who is having the aadhar they will come through the aadhar like in the central government ministries what we did we have sent the uh, data for revalidation to the ministries right in the uh, say scholarship schemes there is just 27000 uh, in the tribal affairs i think i can recall correctly in the tribal affairs they have not given the aadhar so they have been sent for the revalidation so when it is sent for the revalidation and there uh, and other people as the the person who has given the aadhar their fund has been released so what will happen automatically all the students are from the same institutes na in the different different places so it will come that once the person who has given the aadhar they have got the benefit the person who has not given the aadhar they are giving they are being more more and more uh, scrutinized so what will happen the person who is having the aadhar and they have not submitted automatically they will give the aadhar so basically you have to make the life horrible for you have make the life difficult for the person who is not giving the aadhar because we have reached the saturation of more than 100% so how it can be the sir has asked the first question if anybody has do not have the aadhar here so everybody has got the aadhar so uh, if somebody has the age more than 18 so most probably 99.9% either he has or she has the aadhar or he has or she has enrolled for the aadhar so uh, using the basic uh, things we can ensure that aadhar is being captured in the initial stage itself in the case of minor as we have seen almost uh, we are sitting here most of us are the government employee we can uh, just see how we are able to get the child education allowance we are claiming child education allowance every year so in that case who is the beneficiary you are the beneficiary so uh, what happens the benefit is given credited to your bank account or with along with your salary and uh, eligibility criteria is decided based on your children is and class and study right so in that case as we are aware in the as per the aadhar act 3a it is uh, mandatory to ensure whenever you are taking the aadhar of minor the consent of parents mother father or legal guardian has to be taken so it is mandatory so in that case you can take the aadhar of uh, parents and you can also give the option for the uh, children so you can design your scheme in such a way that easily you can capture the data so this is the end to end digitalization as we are telling end to end digitalization basically means that whenever you are designing your scheme a scheme has the three component right somebody will give the application as a department you will do the verifications or you will check the eligibility criteria whether this person is eligible or not and third is giving the payment to the individual if all three component is available online like as a beneficiary i am a beneficiary so i should be able to apply online as a department you should be able to process the applications online and as a department as a government you are able to transfer the benefit to the eligible beneficiary online to their account if three things are there then you are having the in to in digitalization this is very very important for all these schemes because it will be also in the uh, you know important parameters on which be the dbt of a state is being measured so uh, for in twin digitalization the details has been given here like what are the things you can capture in the in twin digitalizations number 1 online self registration it is available in the kutumba as also that individual can register herself or himself it will increase your efficiency it will increase your data credentiality it will increase your data integrity also so let people to give online uh, submission facility in your uh, schemes number 2 aadhar based deduplication so capture the aadhar as i have told you that you design is format in such a way a standard form that aadhar should be taken in the first place itself then ask the other document if required use the local government directory there is a uh, uh, there is a provision there is a uh, you know emphasis that the we should able to collect the data up to the village level this is the vision of our prime minister that uh, the data should be collected on the village level so that we can easily target the ac accurately target the uh, you know issues and we can frame the scheme accordingly so the lgt is a local government directory which is dealt under the um, panchayati raj ministry so lgt code is available when you type lgt you will get the code of each and every districts right so when you are framing the scheme you should get the lgt code also embedded in your uh, your uh, scheme your scheme format so it will give you the accurate data district wise village wise also we have used this in this year 
National Scholarship Program where we are collecting the data up to the village level. So use the LGD code, it is a standard code for uh, everybody. So it will also help you in designing the, framing the policy, framing the schemes, you know, for the future vision, for the future schemes also, for the future intervention also, that uh, wherever there is a lacking something in the particular state or particular district or particular block or particular village, you can do the policy intervention by using this LGD code also. So ensure that the, the L, uh, fund is transferred el el electronically at the base and you will also get the DBT code, right? So uh, DBT code is, it is a div given to the uh, schemes based on the your uh, recommendations, based on the online uh, certain documents are there, you fill it and then we uh, scrutinize it and we give the DBT code. So when you are given the DBT code, of, sorry, for that scheme, so that a scheme when benefit is transferred in the banking ecosystems the D if 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 it is dvt code is there so uh, in the whole banking ecosystem you will be given the preferences like uh, the clients something some payment clearance is taking two days so if it is dvt code it will it will be processed in the same day like uh, there is a certain parameters for the banks by which bank is making the account inoperative if they are not using in the three months or four months when you are using the DBT code, it will be helpful for you to bypass that things. Even if payment failure is there, basically best major issue is payment failure. So that also, that time also will get the standard code in the reverse feedback. So that will help you a lot in the, uh, your uh, ensuring the proper implementation of the scheme. Authentication at the time of benefit transfers, integration with the DigiLocker and Umang. Umang is a um, uh, platform by which all the mobile app is there by all the schemes can be brought under the one um, app right so these are the informative services you can provide so that uh, beneficiary can himself or herself judge that what what is the best for her right similarly the interactive citizen services uh, it is available i have seen that in your kutumba it is already there 24 into 7 there is a grievances a strong robust grievances data cell mechanism so uh, this is the this is has to be adopted in all these schemes, right? And other services like uh, timeline, the data vault, the reporting of the DBT Bharat portal, a promotional videos, like many schemes, like uh, the somebody who is do not know anything, but the visual thing has a lot of impact. So you can make a small video of your scheme, how to register, how to check your application, how to check your benefit status, how to check your payment status, a small, small video can be made and it can be made more interactive so person who is do not know he's illiterate can also see the uh, you know videos and he can understand the scheme better way and he can approach to the authorities wherever it is required very easily so these are the in twin digitalizations it has lot of impact in your i'm again repeating it that uh, uh, measurement of the state uh, uh, you know st state dvt uh, strongness robustness so kindly ensure that these things are being adopted in your schemes. Karnataka details already the highest number of uh, schemes has been notified under the section 7 or section 4. So it is good. There is a few lag so which can easily be addressed. These are the NSP data. NSP data I am just uh, bringing in the notice that uh, the particular uh, NSP uh, there is a mechanism with which applic application is submitted by the candidates. The, the application is being verified by the institutes and the state nodal officials. So INO is institute nodal officials. So these are the pending status of uh, L1 and L2. So 85% pending is with the institutes and 12% uh, pending with the state nodal officials. And 98% application is with Aadhaar. So that is a good thing. Uh, but the pendency has to be clear because it will be easy for the central government to issue the notifications. So uh, one question was Aadhaar can be used as a financial address. So yes, we are using this Aadhaar as a financial address. Um, so Aadhaar basically uh, how it works as a financial address, NPCI will give the details uh, but still I am telling you but by, by using the Aadhaar you can re-authenticate the individual. S what happens? When somebody is having Aadhaar link with their uh, bank account, so individual is need, need not required to give the full detail of bank like IFSC code, bank branch details, account numbers. 
only Aadhaar number is suffice to transfer the benefit to the Aadhaar link bank account. So Aadhaar can be used as a financial address as an authenticator also in that case. And it is empowered. The the comes under the the this uh, this is empowered under the PMLA Act and also under the IBA whenever individual is open their bank accounts, and bank can do the due diligence. So Aadhaar can be used as a financial address also. So uh, I I will I request all the department here to tell your beneficiaries that they should link their Aadhaar with the bank account, right? It will reduce your payment failure also. The, this uh, slide I am not taking it because uh, all the NPCI, the next uh, session, it will be taken in detail. This is the new guideline which I have already uh, spoken that uh, to issue certificates in electronic forms and send with Aadhaar, UIDI OM 11th August facilitate this under scheme section 7 of Aadhaar Act, right? So you can notify it and there is a central government scheme also. Central government has come up with the uh, scheme uh, as a uh, one-time, you know, financial assistance for capital investment in the IT sectors in which if you are using the DBT, uh, DigiLocker and uh, IT system for the DBT, so you will be given the benefit accordingly. So 2000 crore has been earmarked for this. So I request a state government to approach to the METI for this. It is a interest free loan. Thank you. Any doubt you can uh, raise the questions. I hope it has helped, it will help you in uh, understanding the DBT ecosystem. Thank you. Well, now let's break for a direct benefit lunch. <laughs> and we'll convene after the lunch. Okay.